And thank you for joining our August meeting. And for now, will uh, Ms. Wong please take roll? Sure. James Bolton. Two. Robert Brody. Michael Kao. Here. Alex Chen. James Efting. Present. Karim Gongara. Present. Dolores Heisinger. Here. Judge uh, James Herman. Yes. Michael Isari. Here. Larry Kaplan. Alex Chen. Here. Okay. Um, Paul Kramer. Here. Alex Lawrence. Here. Vince Reyes. Here. And um, Don Wilkinson. Here. We have the quorum is here. Thank you very much. We're going to take things a little bit out of order this morning. We will have public comments shortly after we first uh, have Audrey talk about the July 2021 California bar examination. Good morning, everyone. We thought it might be a good idea to start the meeting off with my report on the July 2021 California bar examination. So uh, the July 2021 California bar exam, if you didn't know, it took place on July 27th and 28th with a small number of applicants testing over extended days. 7,925 applicants attended and we had 306 no-shows. Like the two prior remote exams, in addition to offering the test remotely, the exam was also administered at six hotel sites across the state for in-person applicants with extenuating circumstances who requested a quiet place to test, uh, applicants who asked to handwrite the exam, and applicants with a certain accommodations that did not lend themselves to a remote environment. That in-person applicant population for the July exam was 274. During the first day of testing, ExamSoft began to report technical issues across all jurisdictions with a small number of applicants that required a restart of their computer. Over the last three weeks, ExamSoft has conducted an analysis and has reported that the issue was due to high memory utilization between exam monitor, the video proctoring arm of the software, and the main software that generates digital images. ExamSoft reports that the memory issue caused some applicants to experience a black screen, which caused them to have to restart their device to continue. According to ExamSoft, across the nation, and in California specifically, the vast majority of these applicants were able to restart their devices and return to the exam session without a loss of answer content or exam time. A small number of applicants did not get right back into their exam session and submitted their exam session at the time of the black screen, and these applicants required additional assistance. As always, we want an optimal exam taking experience for applicants. We know that this is already an extremely stressful time, not just now, but for the past year and a half for law students and all applicants due to the pandemic. To that end, we really wanna hear from you as part of our own fact gathering. If applicants have not already submitted a general request in their applicant portal about these issues, please do so by going to the general request in your applicant portal, choosing the type exam soft slash Examplify issues and the subtype software issues. And then please detail all the issues you might have had during the July exam. If you have already submitted, and a lot of applicants have, thank you. We have that. You don't need to submit again. We are tracking all of these reported issues along with the information from ExamSoft for our own internal investigation. Once we have a comprehensive assessment of the circumstances, we can determine psychometric implications and next steps. Does anyone have any questions? Hi, Audrey, this is Kareem. Um, is it okay if I ask question and ask the question, Esther? Sure, Kareem. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Um, Audrey, thanks for that update. Um, I know that we're, um, I, I hope we have some statistics or some accurate um, numbers. I'm hearing vast majority in small numbers, but um, is there any idea of actual numbers of people that were impacted and not impacted, or is that still being compiled? I mean, for us specifically, it is still being compiled. What ExamSoft reported out this week was that it was 1% across jurisdictions that needed additional assistance. And so um, with that, oh, I'm sorry, go, go ahead, um, whoever was speaking next. Uh, no, no, you can continue. I'll ask afterwards. All right, thank you, sir. Um, so I hear 1% across jurisdictions. Um, and, and for me, I'm not, I'm not someone that researches those at large numbers, but is there a time when you think we will have actual numbers and what would be our general practice of investigating and providing either support to those students, applicants that were impacted or what is the um, typical scenario that we provide refunds or what, what is the typical follow-up on, on issues like that? Well, I think the most important part right now, Kareem, is the fact gathering so that we can continue to do our own independent investigation and sort of marry what we're hearing from applicants with the uh, information we're getting from ExamSoft. So um, again, we have had a lot of applicants uh, submit general requests to the applicant portal detailing their experience. And we really encourage uh, anyone who's listening, if you haven't done so, please let us know so we can really gather a full scope of what um, occurred and do our own sort of independent investigation of the set of facts and circumstances. And then from there, we're going to decide what to do next. So timeline wise, we're looking at another couple of weeks of fact gathering. Um, I'm sure that's gonna impact test score um, notifications. Um, so are we looking at another uh, at a two, three month process, a month process, or, or what more or less um, are we expecting? I really wish I could drill down and tell you exactly when I'm going to <laughs> know uh, everything from the fact gathering, but I don't have that uh, to tell you right now. I, I would say by the next time we meet in October, we're hoping to have a much more robust picture of um, and more comprehensive update for the committee and for the public. Thank you, Audrey, I appreciate it. Um, oh, Audrey, sorry, one quick thing. I don't think we took roll before, um, before you gave your update. Oh, we did? Okay, thank you, sorry. Uh, Madam Chair, I have one question. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, let's see, um, following up with Kareem and actually Kareem's latter part address some of my, um, not concerns, but um, increase. When will be, I guess I'm trying to establish a good rough time frame of, um, I mean, it's a moving target for sure, but a time frame of how we will be able to handle um, this particular matter. Uh, my first part of the question will be, hopefully can you provide a rough estimate of applicants reaching out to you or through the portal, as you mentioned before, about when roughly should be a estimated cutoff, not a hard cutoff, but an estimate cutoff so we can do the analysis and all that that's needed to determine um, just how we're going to handle this matter. And then roughly, I believe you, Akreem, and you provided the additional response, which is there should be a rough time frame of October, maybe September time frame of everything will be, um, that there will be something more concrete based on the analysis of what the applicants provided right now. Uh, do you want to, so the first part will be, is there any uh, rough estimate timeline that you can provide that applicants should notify the State Bar of California through the portal, whatever means that you mentioned before, so we can, um, you know, at least it's like up to this point, we can start gathering and then we can analyze um, the data. And then I think you mentioned that it's October timeframe will be roughly when we have a good analysis of what to do. Right, so I'm expecting the next time we meet to have a much more comprehensive update for, for you and for the public. And then um, 
I would say to applicants, you know, if you haven't submitted, and, and we did have several hundred submit as if that you were asking, I don't have the exact number in front of me from the database, but um, during contemporaneously during the week of the exam, we've had, uh, we were encouraging through our call center and through our own staff to, to have applicants submit those issues so we could do this tracking. It, uh, we just don't know what we don't know. So if you haven't submitted, do it as soon as possible. Of course, we don't want to hold up anything in the normal course of what we do post exam. So I don't want to say a hard cutoff because I just really want to encourage people to uh, tell us. We really want to know how your experience was. And um, if there's something that we just don't know that happened during the exam, we would like to find out. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, hopefully by giving this update first, we've also answered some questions in advance uh, before we take public comment. Uh, Audrey, when's the deadline to uh, receive information from applicants? I don't think I heard of that. Oh, I didn't say a deadline because I don't want to okay. discourage anyone. I want to uh, go ahead. I think a lot of folks have, but please tell us as soon as possible. Um, if we decide that we need to have a hard cutoff, then we'll, we'll push out a notification to applicants. But I just want to encourage everyone to just go to your general request area in the applicant portal. There's a type that you can pull down just for this subject, exam soft slash exemplify issues. There's a subtype of software concerns. And then just let us know what your experience was. Audrey, I got a question for you. Uh, based on your review and receipts of public comments to date, have you seen anything that is out of the ordinary uh, or technical issues that we haven't seen in prior administration of bar exam. Well, what ExamSoft is reporting to us, this high memory utilization, and I know Alex, you and Michael have maybe <laughs> even more idea of some of what the software um, memory means, but there was high memory utilization between exam monitor, so the, the video recording, and then the main software renderer, which is how you produce digital images. And that is something reported out to ExamSoft, from ExamSoft, sorry, this week to us, um, that, that hadn't been reported out in prior exams. From my inkling, without much more data, I'm sure there'll be more data. It sounds like a RAM slash memory leak issue, but that's pure speculation. But like say, um, high memory band usage leads usually to that. Right, and that's what we have reported out from ExamSoft of the issue. Is, is there any chance that ExamSoft will be here to present or give us feedback on, on what their uh, practice is moving forward? Um, I think we're at our second or third administration, and I think we're finding new problems. So do we know what our plan is to address that? Oh, in terms of asking them to report as part of the October meeting? Yeah. I mean, that's something we could take back. I'm not sure. I, I couldn't speak for them. Okay. I think it would be helpful because we're finding ourselves um, at another uh, nexus of, of these issues that are impacting applicants. And Kareem, I, like I, to... just, Kareem, I just want to be clear, understand uh, you're asking if possible to bring ExamSoft in to do sort of a, a presentation, sort of update on the issues that they encountered or in, from the administration and then also sort of their next steps. Correct, yes. I like to second Kareem. Of course, this is not phoning procedures, but I hearken that we should be providing an opportunity to talk more with someone from ExamSoft, um, whether open or private. Um, in other words, open meeting or closed meeting to discuss um, this issue and anything else. We will certainly extend that um, request to ExamSoft and we'll report back um, through Alex and Esther um, between now and the next meeting on 
um, on ExamSoft's receptivity to that request, but we'll absolutely extend that request. Anything else at this time? Thank you, Audrey. So I think now might be an appropriate time to take the public comments in light of the presentation that was just made. As noted on the agenda for today's meeting, public comments during the meeting will be limited. Members of the public wishing to comment were encouraged to submit written comments prior to the meeting to ensure that the committee would have time to consider those comments. The committee has received and read all the written public comments, so thank you for that. Uh, Kim Wong will be calling members of the public in the order that they appear. And as of right now, we only have one, is that correct, Kim? Yes, that is correct. Okay. So it's increasing. Um, based on the number that we have right now, and it can change. So I'll be asking to limit your comments to two minutes to facilitate hearing as many members of the public as possible. Please do not repeat points that on the important topics that it will be discussing today we will not be able to hear more than a maximum of 30 minutes of total public comments. For those of you that are participating via Zoom video, you should have a function for virtually raising your hand. It's a hand icon and should appear at the bottom center of your screen. If you wish to make a public comment, please click on that. And for those of you participating by phone, you may virtually raise your hand by pressing star nine. That's the star key then the number nine, uh, Ms. Wong will call members of the public in the order that they identify with their raised hands and will enable the microphones of the speakers. Thank you. Just a reminder that um, I, when I call your name, you, when you have 30 seconds remaining, please begin to wrap up your comments and, uh, and end within the allotted time. Thank you. So at the moment, um, my first, the first public comment is from Sabi, Sab, Sabsi, Sabsi. Hi, Kim. Yes, it's Sabzi. Um, so I took the um, July assessment um, and I just wanted to flag, I appreciate that you flagged this only 1%. And uh, exam softs, there was um, memory issues, but I just also wanted to remind everybody that uh, prior to taking the assessment, I contacted exam soft approximately 10 times. Um, and on each occasion, I was calling to confirm that my memory was sufficient, my settings were fine, and also to make sure that the mock exams are uploaded um, correctly as well. And on each occasion, I was advised, yes, everything's fine, is correct. And then a day before the assessment or two days before the assessment, I was advised that um, the mock exams, I had not uploaded them um, and I had not completed them, which was not correct. And they advised me that I needed to um, complete an additional two mocks. So in that uh, kind of state of mind and stress, I uploaded it and did it again. Uh, and again, confirmed a night before the assessment that my software and uh, memory was sufficient. And I was advised on each occasion that it was. And then unfortunately on the assessment on the day, the first day um, I had um, a freeze three times. And then on the second day, there was a freeze uh, approximately two or three times. And then there were problems with the performance test and specifically the, the content. I was unable to read it. The document was freezing. So I just wanted to flag, I appreciate what you said about one minute being lost here and uh, if applicants were able to resume, but I do want to stress that that kind of stress, um, the way that it throws you, we're already panicked. Uh, and, yeah, so I just wanted to flag that 
that should be taken into consideration regardless of it being a minute or 15 minutes it throws the examinee off and it has a severe impact on their ability to complete the assessment thank you thank you the next the next person is inga homesquip Hi, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, sort of to piggyback on what the first speaker just said, for one thing, I am skeptical of the 1% because I took the exam at a law school, which was able to accommodate about eight test takers. And I think only two did not have their uh, software freeze and freeze repeatedly. One person had it freeze for every essay, I had it freeze during one of the essays and twice during the performance exam. And everybody just had war stories. It was, it was horrible. So I, I'm very skeptical of the 1%. And uh, also a friend of mine who had a similar occurrence to the first speaker where he, she was told that she had not taken the mock exams, but had and had the confirming emails in hand and they wouldn't let her take the exam. They wouldn't let her sit the exam while they figured out whether or not, in fact, looking at the confirming emails, oh yeah, she did, we lost the data. So I think exam solve does need to be held to account and we need to press them on those statistics. I'm not buying it just from my personal experience with my classmates who took the exam. It was much more, much more the off, often the case that it froze than that it didn't. And a single freeze was not the norm. It would freeze again and again. And I think that most people that I took the exam with probably don't know that they should be reporting this for the, for the particular portal. It wasn't okay, easy to find. If you want more information, I would suggest that you more proactively push emails out to people that took the exam and request more details about their experience. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next person is Josh M. Yes, hi. Thank you for allowing me to, to voice my public comment. It's not specifically related to the recent administration of the California bar exam, but I submitted a written comment uh, in advance of the meeting. So I'll try to summarize that really quickly for the members of the public that are listening. Uh, the California bar exam CNF character and fitness process serves an important role vetting future California attorneys to determine whether they currently possess the requisite good moral character to practice law. Unfortunately, the process is rife with delay, even for unblemished applicants, and requires a six-month uh, window of waiting before an application begins to be processed. Uh, as it stands, the California CNF process takes most applicants longer than their entire bar study and bar examination period. California's process takes significantly longer than the states with similarly sized legal markets like New York, and several times longer than smaller legal market states. A re-examination of the CNF evaluation process is perhaps in order with an eye towards efficient solutions to alleviate the points, creating bottleneck delays. Alternative processing schemes, including automation of the first stages of applicant review should be explored. I would be happy to personally volunteer in reaching out to capable software development companies who could help automate the process of screening the initial applications via requests for proposal. I think I'm uniquely qualified to do so because I have a technical background in uh, industrial and electrical engineering and operational efficiency, as well as a law degree from Cornell. And I'm a newly minted California attorney. So ultimately, such a solution could reduce the wait time for unblemished applicants by a factor of several months, while enabling California Bar CNF investigators to refocus their time on manually processing applicants with monthly or misconduct disclosure. Marie, can you wrap up your comments, please? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, Ms. Wong has my contact information, so if any of you would be willing to explore these solutions with me further. Thank you for your comment, Mr. Montgomery. The next, um, I guess we don't have any more public comments at the moment, Ms. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Long. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I guess, um, well, there's one person, but he already gave the public comments. So that's, that's the end of the public comments. Thank you, Ms. Long. 
that will conclude the public comment section. And I do apologize. I did forget to ask to take roll. Ms. Wong, could you please take roll? We did this morning. Uh, yeah. yeah, we did take roll. Yeah. Um, was it after the, the uh, meeting went live to public yes. broadcast? Yes, we did. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. So then our next one is the approval of the June 18th, 2021 Committee of Bar Examiners Public Meeting Minutes. Does anyone have any questions or comments or is there a motion to approve and file, receive and file? I'll make I'll a motion to approve file. the minutes. This is Vince. I'll second thank Vince's you. motion. And thank you, Jim. Uh, roll call vote, please. Yes. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Dr. Kao? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. Mr. Efting? Mr. Efting? Sorry, yes. Mr. Gongora? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Judge Herman? Yes. Mr. Isari? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. And Dr. Wilkinson? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. And right now, uh, I'll turn it over to Amy. Thank you, Esther. I'm going to share my screen. All right. Okay, so the first item I want to discuss that's on our agenda are there is a report on key statistical indicators. The report uh, we have uh, is for the months of May, June, and July of this year. Our key statistical indicators capture the number of applications received by the Office of Admissions to date, along with last year's count. So for this period, uh, this is May through July. Um, I'm going to highlight the applications that have experienced a 15% change when compared to the previous year. Um, there we go. For this uh, cycle, uh, there are a few areas that have experienced a 15% change, including applicants placed on the motion. As you can see here uh, in the report that was attached to the agenda, there are 60, there's a 68% increase in the number of applicants placed on the motion compared to the same period that's May, June, and July of 2020. Um, but as noted um, during the June meeting, this is primarily due to the fact that the October 2020 bar exam postponement delayed the is, results release um, to this year. Um, so that is, uh, explains that anomaly. As for the uh, remaining items, the number of registrations received. Uh, this year, we received approximately 42% less attorney registrations during this same period compared to uh, last year, as well as attorney examinations. In May through July of this year, the office received 43% uh, less applications for the bar exam from attorney applicants during this period last year. As for moral character determinations, we have 74% more applications this year, this during this period compared to 2020, uh, which may be related to provisional licensing. Moral character determination uh, extension applications, we have 38% less this year uh, for this period compared to 2020. And that's also consistent with what was reported in June, 2021 at our last meeting. Lastly, um, we have 26% more pro hoc VJ applications during this period compared to last year. Are there any questions related to the key statistical indicators? Okay, 
The next item is a review. Um, there's a schedule uh, for the October 15th, 16th uh, meeting that's coming up, uh, the Committee of Bar Examiners. Uh, that meeting will also include a CBE orientation session as we do every October, and all uh, members are encouraged to attend that session. Um, a question? Yes. Um, so are we expecting to need the time on Saturday? We uh, leave that in the event that we have um, any uh, uh, a need for us to um, cover items uh, in multiple days. So uh, that's why a two day schedule is uh, reflected in here, but um, we don't necessarily need that Saturday if we can cover all our items on Friday. Okay, so there's nothing specifically scheduled for Saturday. No. There okay, is. thanks. Sure. Uh, I have a question. Um, any uh, talk about or whatever about going back to in-person meetings or is that pretty much with Delta uh, uh, pretty much off the table at least through the end of the year? Uh, we um, uh, want to make sure that we're adhering to um, like uh, COVID restrictions um, and, and you know, COVID concerns. Um, I know we recently had a uh, you know, discuss the option of perhaps uh, being in person, but I think we're going to rely on the climate of, of the COVID restrictions at that time. So if we know in advance that, um, you know, there's flexibility in that, we, we can extend that to the CBE. But as it stands right now, I think we're planning on continuing as a Zoom meeting. Do you think that would go through the end of the year, include the December meeting as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't forecast what's going to happen, but I think we, we're going to remain flexible with that. <clears throat> Amy? Yes? Uh, just a, a technical issue here. On my screen, um, uh, your slide never progressed beyond the first one. Did was that is that on my end or on your end? Uh, on my end, it's showing the key statistical indicators. Let me stop sharing and do this again. Sometimes it happens when you're presenting and you have Zoom on, so I apologize for that. But uh, let's see, did that help? Does that help? I just redid it. Yeah, like, but it never, that, that's only the first slide. I never saw the one with the numbers on it. Oh, the numbers I took from the report. Oh, okay. But you yeah. had another two more slides there that show no. Oh yeah, that's for my upcoming agenda items. I, I'm going to talk about provisional licensing uh, next. Okay. Okay. Got it. Thank you. All right. Sorry about that. I thought my computer was freezing here on the mine. <laughs> no. Um. Yeah. Uh, so it's the, my slides. For for smaller screen folks, um, I'm not one of them, but uh, if you made the slide full screen rather than us seeing your your interface, that'd be even better. Okay. Will do. Let me, okay, that's working now. Is that better? Yeah. All right, sorry about that. I'm giving everybody an eye test. <laughs> All right, uh, any other items? All right, wonderful. So uh, the next item I uh, is the attached uh, schedule of meetings for 2022. Um, those are meetings for our next uh, exam, uh, term. Um, so if there are any questions related to those meetings, please alert either Kim or, um, or me about uh, any concerns with those. And with that, we'll move into the updates from the Office of Admissions. And so the first item I wanna update everybody on is on provisional licensing. And this is why full screen is important. These are, this is quite a few uh, different set of numbers. So this is our report as of yesterday. This report separates uh, and differentiates between applicants who are eligible for the program based on graduation date versus those that were eligible based on program expansion. And as you can see here, we have a total of about 1,552 applicants uh, who are uh, have submitted an application to the program as of yesterday uh, that uh, are eligible based on uh, having graduated between December 2019 and December 2020, and approximately 832 that are in the 
program expansion. That is the pathway that allows full licensing without a bar exam. The uh, deadline for that program has ended. So this is our pretty much our full cohort of uh, what will be in the program. So 832. Um, and uh, as you can see here, we have approximately almost a thousand applicants that are currently active, uh, actively participating uh, in the program as provisionally licensed lawyers. Um, Amy, has anyone in the uh, program expansion, um, we use the term graduated in that they completed all the requirements and have been sworn in as a bar member? Yes. So uh, what kind of line is that? Um, that's not on here. That's a separate report and it's just one line item. So uh, approximately 200 applicants have uh, met the criteria, all criteria uh, required from expanded pathways. That is, they've met the 300 hours of serv legal service delivery, as well as gotten a positive reference from the course, their corresponding supervisor or supervisors. So we have approximately 200 in that category. And they're not reflected in here because this is looking at active applications. They would be reflected in that uh, terminated category. Uh, right now that reflects 163. And I mentioned that there are 200 and that's because 200 oath packets went out. Uh, we're still getting, uh, they're, they're not terminated until we get their oath packets back to ensure that uh, you know, they're still serving under provisional licensing until they, be, they get a, uh, a state bar number. So um, there are about 200 to answer your question, Paul. Okay, so um, there's other things that could fit into the terminated category, right? Um, absolutely. Somebody ends their uh, position. Uh, we could also have applicants who, um, yeah, uh, uh, just terminate for a variety of reasons in, the, in, that, uh, in their positions as provisionally licensed lawyers. Okay, if it works, it might be nice to just add a line for those who who successfully graduated, because um, it tells the whole story. Mm -hmm. Will do. Hi, Amy, this is Kareem. Um, good morning. I had a question on demographic information. Are we capturing that with this program? Um, we don't have it in a report right now, but um, uh, would it be uh, difficult to gather? Awesome, maybe for the next meeting, we could just get that um, as a second slide. I think that'd be uh, beneficial. All right, we can do that. Thank you, Amy. Sure. All right, any other questions um, before we move on to our next item? Okay, I'll stop my screen. One of the next items is an update on the Blue Ribbon Commission of the on the future of the bar exam. And Esther um, Lynn and Alex Chan, will, uh, members of the CBE on that commission will be uh, conducting that presentation. Okay, so for the Blue Ribbon Commission, we were tasked with um, let me pull it up. We've been studying whether or not the UBE would be appropriate. And if the UBE is appropriate, we may adopt a California component. And if the UBE is not appropriate, then we're looking into whether or not it's reasonable to develop a California alternative exam. We're considering other exam alternatives and considering other formats as well. Um, one of the things that we are looking into is the role of the multi-state bar examination, specifically whether or not we should keep the multiple choice component. There are three states that, are, that do not have a multi-state bar examination, just specifically Nevada, Louisiana, and Indiana. And right now we're looking into what effects or impacts it has had in their in, in their legal profession. And I don't know if Alex would like to chime in. Sure. Um, I think you cover uh, just about most of the things I want to talk about, but the only thing I want to add is um, the commission went through quite a lot of stuff, actually. We went through things like applicant characteristics by school type. We went through the profile of different bar exam takers. We also discussed applicant age by school time and bar exam passing, uh, passing rates among different cohorts of applicants. Um, we as a commission also went through uh, the design and specification of the bar exam, including 
diving into the pros and the cons of using a multiple choice format. And more fundamentally, we discuss the strength and the weaknesses of the MBE. And there are many. Uh, we explore the possibility of eliminating, eliminating the multiple choice components and also its potential impact on the bar exam by looking at um, as, as you clearly stated, the three states that are not used in the MBE component. And on the substantive uh, front, we studied various findings and recommendations by Kappa and the NCBE, including discussing the various legal topics uh, that were recommended for competency and really gauging you know, the key similarities and the differences between them, including the topics that they see as vital to practicing law. Um, also, uh, the NCBE did a three-year study from, if I remember correctly, 2018 to 2021, I think early this year, on test knowledge and skills and abilities required for competent entry-level practice. And we were able to get all the nuts and bolts of this study through a presentation by Judge Cynthia Martin and NCBE. Um, we also invited, if I remember correctly, we also invited the Department of Consumer Affairs to speak about the advantages as well as disadvantages of the written format as part of the leave no you know, stone unturned approach to truly assess whether and what changes we need to make to the exam, if any, to truly ensure a fair and equitable exam that is appropriate for testing minimum competence to practicing law. Our next meeting is gonna be in a few weeks on September 1st, at which time we'll then break into subcommittees to study, and evaluate and hopefully draft various recommendations for the entire commission's consideration. Um, I think that's what I remember. Did I miss anything, um, Esther? No, that one's pretty comprehensive. And Amy also gave a presentation at the Blue Ribbon Commission meeting last time and it was really helpful. Mm -hmm. You wanted to talk about it as well, Amy? Um, yes, so I um, presented on um, basically uh, how the uh, bar exam uh, came to be as it is now. Um, and one thing I wanted to do is encourage uh, CBE members, um, if you'd like to attend the session, uh, we it's held um, publicly. So our next one, as Alex stated, is on September 1st from 10 to about 4.20. Uh, the agenda will soon be posted um, and they're very informative. We also um, are webcasting them. So they're available on our website and I can share that link with the committee. Uh, if you go to our uh, webcast, if you go to the BRC uh, webpage, the webcast link is available there. Um, lastly, I think um, if there are any agenda items that appear in the BRC, we'd be more than happy to also present them here at CBE. Uh, I think uh, at some point, um, Paul, uh, you know, had uh, raised that as an idea, um, and it might be a good one. If there's anything on that agenda that you think we could share here, uh, that we would gladly schedule that. Uh, Amy, two questions. Um, what's the timetable for the ultimate completion of this task, and what is the CBE's role going to be in the process? So um, right now we're looking at about an 18 month um, uh, initiative, you know, so given that we started in July, um, it's, uh, I think I, the report is scheduled uh, somewhere around January of 2023. Sorry, I'm trying to do math all at the same time. And so, um, uh, so I think that's what's happening. And in terms of the CBE, um, you know, uh, the uh, Supreme Court, Court is ultimately going to make this decision, but they're going to rely on the expertise of um, both this commission and the, you know, the link between this commission and the CBE, um, you know, the ideas of Alex and Esther um, or uh, bring ideas to this committee as decisions are uh, being made by this commission. Uh, the commission ultimately will be making the report and recommendations that go to the Supreme Court. So it also would bypass the um, Board of Trustees? Uh, you know, I can't, let me see if we have- you know, a, a presentation will be made from the, um, from the Blue Ribbon Commission to the Board of Trustees, and then the Board of Trustees will uh, determine what to pass forward to the Supreme Court. 
Okay, but we won't. So if we want to have any sort of input in this process, we need to have a, a way of um, basically informing our representatives um, of our concerns, ideas, desires, um, and then they need to be able to brief us. Um, okay, interesting. Um, yeah, and, and so what I'd suggest, we are likely to create two subcommittees at next week's meeting um, for the future, um, for the immediate future anyway. Um, and so I would suggest, for example, that Esther be on one of those subcommittees and Alex be on another subcommittee. And yes, the, um, we should make sure to build in some substantial time, I think, for them to present at each of the subsequent CBE meetings. We've only had the the one meeting so far with the Blue Ribbon Commission. The, fir the, the first several meetings are, um, are, are informational and level setting, really throwing a, quite a lot of information at the, um, at the members of the Blue Ribbon Commission. Much of this is information that the CBE members are, are, are well aware of. This is information that you've lived and breathed for a number of years. And so we're trying to level set right now um, with the members of the commission. Um, and then we just need to make sure to set aside some substantial time, as I was saying, for Esther and Alex to present at future CBE meetings to give you an update on, on questions, discussions, directions, get your feedback. They are the CBE liaisons to this. And so get your feedback um, for them to bring back to the subcommittees they sit on and the full, uh, the full commission. Okay, well, I think it's good for us to rec recognize at this early stage the mechanism by which we will be participating. Thanks for that. And I will make myself available if any of my colleagues would like to have a call <clears throat> so I can understand your concern and, and anything that you would like me to relate to the commission. Um, I'm definitely available at any time uh, for such a call. Uh, again, the, the next meeting is going to be on September 1st. So um, feel free to get in touch with me and we can have an offline chat um, and to address those concerns with you. Yeah, I already viewed the first to half of the video, the first one of two, and I'm, I'll try to get to the other one um, in between. Um, and uh, of course, we could always make public comments uh, as long as we're clear that we are doing that in our individual capacity and not as a representative of the committee. Uh, right, Caroline? Yes, that's right. Okay. Any other issues um, or questions about the BRC? All right, and the last item uh, uh, on the updates is a differential item functioning. Uh, Bethany, uh, unfortunately, uh, was not able to attend today's meeting. Uh, so I will provide that update. So um, as you know, we have a joint effort between the Council on Access and Fairness and the CVE that's working on um, uh, looking at differential item functioning, uh, using that report and looking at actual exam items to determine, uh, to develop guidelines that will be used to, uh, in an effort to reduce the potential for any future differential item functioning. Uh, the group has met, uh, I think, um, as, a, as a full group twice. We have uh, working groups that have been established that are digging into the questions that part of the task is not complete. We're hoping to do that by the end of this month uh, with our next meeting scheduled potentially in September. Uh, I think once we gather, we can start formulating those guidelines. And so we have more to come probably in the next couple of months. Any other questions related to differential item functioning? All right. Uh, well, with that, uh, I think I'm done with my portion of the a uh, meeting, Esther. Thank you. Do we have the presenter available um, on the bar exam strategies yet? Or should we just, if not, then we'll just move on to examinations briefly. How about that? That would be great. Thank you, Esther. OK. So let's move on to the examinations with Jim Efting until 10 o'clock. And we'll have a presentation at 10. Okay, thank you, Esther. Thank you. So this is agenda, agenda item 0200. It basically is the, uh, the goals and accomplishments of the examination subcommittee. Um, there are 13 items on it. 
most of it just is ongoing work that we're doing. Um, some things I want to comment on, I believe um, on item number eight, we were talking about whether the BRE report would be coming in late 2022. It looks like it will now be coming in early 2023, but I don't think we need to change the goals for that. The other item I had with Lisa was that on item number 10, it talks about work is ongoing and including the following broadening education and outreach to the legal community. Um, and I don't remember seeing that in any of our recent meetings with the examination committee. Is that something that, um, that I missed or is that something that? Um, okay, so 10, am I on the right page? Hopefully I'm not on mute. Um, yeah, that's something that the um, that Christina and I have been working um, with COAF on. And so COAF has some um, requests in terms of um, outreach for graders to try to broaden our grader pool. Um, so I believe that's what 10 is about. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's basically broadened outreach to the legal community to, um, you know, advertise the uh, greater program. So uh, the, with the idea being to um, increase the diversity of our graders, uh, mostly geographically, because we had um, in the past mainly focused on graders, um, recruiting graders from the greater Bay Area for, for many reasons, uh, one of which was uh, primarily because we had hard copy materials and um, you know, was, uh, uh, was not feasible or practical to have all of that material shipped uh, all over the state. So, uh, and then also our calibration meetings were in person. So, um, so anyway, that, that's what mainly that um, number one under um, 10, goal 10 is about. Okay, I missed part of that. I got cut out temporarily. So is that something we're going to discuss in future meetings? Um, sure, if you want to, you know, if the committee wants to know more about uh, what we're um, doing with COAF. Maybe you and I can talk about that. We can then bring it up to the next meeting, examinations subcommittee. Sure. Um, so those are the items that are on the goals and accomplishments. Does anybody have any questions or comments about uh, examination subcommittee's goals or comments? Um, I'm not hearing anybody. No. Is there a motion to um, agree with the staff? So move, Ms. Kareem. So, oh, I, I can put up the, the motion. Um, I can share my screen and put up the motion. Hold on. Uh, uh, it's it's up. It's oh, it's up. up? Okay, sorry. We'll second the motion. This is Vince. Okay, uh, do we want, need a roll call vote on this? Yes. I believe yes. Okay, you wanna go ahead and do the roll call vote? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, and Dr. Bolton? Yes. Dr. Cow? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Gongora? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Judge Herman? Yes. Mr. Isseri? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Ria? Yes. And Dr. Wilkinson? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. I think that's all for me. Thanks, Jim. I'm going to turn it over to Alex for the operation, operations and management portion. Thanks, Chair. Uh, looking at the O&M goals, uh, there are several that have been ongoing, but want to draw everyone's attention to a couple being numbers four and number six as a result of the uh, current conditions in the pandemic, uh, those items have been deferred. Number uh, four, specifically about training videos that's been uh, mentioned in the past, but uh, specifically for number six, um, there was going to be a, a report on examination fees and the cost differential uh, for attorney applicants. 
And again, that was scheduled for the, uh, the August meeting, today's meeting, but will be presented at the October committee meeting. Um, and I think that's primarily it. Uh, Tammy, if you have any additional comments that you wanna make? I do not at this time, thank you. Great, thank you. So uh, with that, I'll open it up if there's any questions or comments uh, before seeking a motion. There are no comments, Alex, I'll move to approve. I'll second. Kareem. Thank you. Can we have a roll call vote? Yes, Dr. Bolton? Yes. Dr. Kao? Yes. Mr. Chen? Mr. Efton? Yes. Mr. Gongora? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Judge Herman? Yes. Mr. Isseri? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Rios? Yes. Dr. Wilkinson? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. So do we have our presenter present yet? It looks like they're still in the process of joining. So Ms. Kim is on, but I don't see uh, Victor Kinsmia yet. Okay, so I'm going to take it a little out of order just because of the items listed under Ed Standards. Can we jump to moral character on the goals and accomplishments, Tara? Would you be ready for that yet? Of course. So thank you. Um, so thank you. So since Bethany is out, she did ask um, us to just present this today. So you have the goals and accomplishments for this year. The only thing I wanted to call out is for the December meeting, Justice Moore and Dr. West have agreed to conduct a presentation on PTSD. Um, and I will open it up for questions if there are any. Not seeing any, so I'm gonna go ahead and share the motion. And is there a motion? So moved. Kramer. Kareem will second. I'll second. So seconded by Mr. Gongora. And Dr. Bolton? Yes. Dr. Kao? Yes. Mr. Chen? Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Gongora? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Judge Herman? Yes. Mr. Iseri? Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Rios? Yes. Dr. Wilkinson? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you, Kim, and thank you, Tara, for accommodating <laughs> the schedule change. Um, I don't think the presenter's available yet, and because Ed standards is rather comprehensive and there's nothing else in moral character other than a presentation. Why don't we take a five minute break? It's 9.59 on my clock right now. How about coming back at 10.05 and maybe by then the presenters will be ready. Good, thank you. Thank you.
Ah, sorry about that. I was using the participant ID rather than the, uh, the web link that was causing the issue. Thank oh. you. Sorry about that, Victor. Um, so we just took a quick break, so we should be reconvening about 10.04, 10.05, so. Okay, I was clicking on the, um, the wrong meeting ID number, not the participant one. <laughs> Apologies. The attendee, so I, I apologize. Okay. Okay. Tara, can I uh, see if I can share my screen? Just practice for just a second. Um, that's, sure, I think that should be fine. Okay. Just. And I can see it. Okay, you can see it. Perfect. All right, I'll stop sharing then. Thank you. Okay, it's 10.05 and I believe our presenter is here now. So um, let's get started. The presentation will be on bar exam strategies and stories. So uh, I'll hand it over to you now, Victor. Wonderful. Um, it is such a pleasure to be able to speak with the committee here today. Um, before I get started, I'd like to uh, um, have my fellow uh, team members, researchers, introduce one, of them, uh, one another uh, themselves, and then we'll go ahead and speak about the presentation. Um, so I'll begin first. Uh, my name is Victor Quintanilla. I'm a professor at Indiana University. I'm, doing a, I'm both in the law school, also uh, in the psychology department, uh, completing a, a PhD there. I'm running a center here, the Center for Law, Society, and Culture, and I'm one of the principal investigators on this project, the Mindsets and Legal Education Project. Um, uh, I'll turn it over to, to Sam. Hi, thank you so much for uh, having us. I'm Sam Ehrman. I'm a professor of law at the USC Gould School of Law. And I'm also a principal investigator on this project and very excited about what we're gonna get to share today. And I will pass off to Dr. Anita Kim. Hi, I'm Anita Kim. Thanks for having us. Uh, I'm a social psychologist and I'm the research director for MILE. And I will turn it over to Nadim. Hi everyone, I'm Nadim and uh, I teach advanced stats and research methods at University of Massachusetts, Boston. 
and I help with the uh, number crunching in the project. Okay, um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen now, uh, and we'll get started with the presentation. Here we go. All right, you can see it? Great. Um, okay, so uh, thank you again for allowing this opportunity for our team to update uh, the Committee of Bar Examiners. Um, it's been a, um, a few years since we first began this project and shared uh, uh, the development of it uh, with, with the committee. And we're truly excited about uh, presenting some of the results uh, for this four-year milestone uh, on the project. So um, just a bit about our team, as you have already heard, um, we are researchers in law school, psychology departments, uh, ed schools, statistics as well. Um, and we're um, at a variety of institutions, uh, including Stanford, USC, uh, Michigan, University of Massachusetts, Wake Forest, uh, among others. Um, and the team collectively, truly collectively has uh, developed what we're gonna share today um, and some of the, the results as well. So here's an outline for what we're going to be talking about. Um, first, I'm going to introduce uh, the committee on um, some psychology, psychological friction in law school and bar passage and how that interferes with um, allowing applicants to reach their fullest potential and what can be done about it. Uh, we'll talk about some of the surveys and focus groups that we conducted on this particular project back in 2017 that helped uh, inspire the development of, of the program. Uh, we'll talk about the design of the program, what it is, and then the four-year milestone analysis. Um, so uh, one thing that we have found uh, over time is that psychological friction in law school and bar passage plays an under-recognized role um, in really uh, affecting the experiences and the performance of uh, law school students uh, and uh, applicants and test takers. This includes feeling that one doesn't belong academically, culturally, and socially, experiencing doubts about one's potential um, and intelligence, their ability to excel in various domains, um, maladaptive theories about stress, including stressing about the stress that's experienced uh, when uh, uh, sitting for high stakes uh, experiences like taking the bar exam, and also endorsing fixed mindset beliefs about one's ability that can interfere with one's uh, ability to learn and grow. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about this um, in the context of the surveys and focus groups that we conducted in July 2017 uh, with California bar exam takers. We actually partnered with the State Bar of California to gather data regarding students' experiences of psychological friction while preparing for the bar exam and use this to help design and evaluate the intervention that we developed, which was aimed at the 2018 cohort um, initially uh, to alleviate this kind of psychological friction that we would learn about tamping down stress and, feel, and freeing up these executive resources in order to really um, unlock uh, this ability and potential when students are studying and preparing over the summer. So we conducted these surveys and focus groups in uh, 2017 uh, with um, a variety of applicants after they prepared for the bar exam. Um, they were primarily uh, coming from the LA schools um, and it, the invitations were sent out by law school teams who encouraged them to participate. We ultimately recruited um, about 205 uh, applicants and we provided them a survey um, uh, to better understand their mindset beliefs about bar performance, studying behaviors, self-efficacy and confidence. One of the things that we found um, in this survey is there were a variety of psychological experiences that were correlated to these mindset beliefs. That is these mindset beliefs um, uh, about performance of the bar and believing that it's something that uh, can ultimately be improved uh, was correlated with um, uh, beliefs about the potential to succeed on the bar, uh, beliefs about being capable to meet the demands of studying and handling stress, also emotional regulation. It was negatively correlated. The more that they uh, applicants had these adaptive mindset beliefs during this study process, uh, the less they had stress uh, and these concerns, uh, these concerning psychological experiences around depression and loneliness. We also learned that these mindset beliefs were positively correlated to self-efficacy and confidence um, and uh, uh, negatively correlated with the beliefs that the bar is overwhelmingly demanding um, or um, so demanding that it can't truly be something that um, uh, 
uh, can be prepared for. Um, interestingly, we didn't find that these beliefs were correlated to behavior itself in terms of time, but we later found that it has to do not with the quantity of time studying, but the kind of quality of the experience of studying um, uh, and the kind of learning that happens um, over time over the summer. So uh, drawing from the focus groups and the surveys, we actually had focus groups at USC after fielding these surveys, we really uh, circled around these three, um, these three themes. Uh, what we found was that there, the students, these, these, these applicants uh, truly had um, uh, concerns um, and they were expressing limiting uh, fixed mindset beliefs and potentially maladaptive behavior around making mistakes during the summer uh, when studying for the bar exam. So each time they made a mistake on a multiple choice exam or an essay, there's a variety of ways of thinking about those kinds of mistakes. And some of these maladaptive uh, beliefs uh, can make it make you begin to wonder whether you truly have what it takes to do well in these domains. There was also stress relating to, a lot of stress relating to fear of failure, time constraints, the amount of information necessary to memorize in the summer, negative feedback. And not only was there a lot of stress, but uh, applicants began stressing about the stress that they were experiencing. So having this psychological arousal led to worry about whether this stress was going to interfere with their performance along the way. Um, there was also flagging motivation both towards the beginning that delayed some of the study process and later in the summer when students were exhausted um, uh, as well um, that, uh, that they reported. So let's uh, dig into some of these three areas, which ultimately became the three building blocks of the program, our Bar Strategies and Stories program. Um, so one of the sources of psychological friction that can undermine performance on high stakes exams is this fixed mindset. So students' concerns about their potential. The term mindset refers to personal beliefs about the malleability of human characteristics. And what we know is fixed mindsets are the belief that intelligence and abilities are fixed, that potential can't be changed, that you either have it or you don't. Whereas growth mindsets are related to the belief that intelligence and abilities are malleable, that uh, one has the potential to improve with effort and learning. We know that fixed mindset beliefs can undermine motivation and performance, especially when students, because of these mindset beliefs, interpret mistakes as a sign that they've reached the limit of their ability um, and um, this is especially when they believe intelligence, their potential, or fixed quality. Uh, this can undermine motivation to persist when studying, reduce performance. There are uh, so many studies now that reveal that these, uh, these potential just construals, these interpretations about, uh, about what mistakes mean can have these maladaptive uh, downstream consequences. Um, uh, and so we learned about this. We know that growth mindsets can boost motivation and performance. Um, that is growth mindsets is the belief that intelligence and potential can be developed and expanded through effort, persistence and good strategies, and it enhances motivation to persist when studying it, um, and can boost performance on high stakes exams. The second area that we learned about were these uh, um, theories or uh, at times maladaptive theories, stress mindsets about stress. And what we know is that these mindsets about stress can actually uh, may or may not enhance motivation, learning, and performance. So for example, the belief that stress, this physiological arousal that one can experience um, is something that is debilitating and, and to be avoided. Um, this, uh, this worrying about that kind of physiological arousal can actually undermine performance and motivation, especially on high stakes exams when the stress is high. Whereas in contrast, the construal that stress is necessary and facilitating that this can actually energize one to improve their motivation, learning and performance, especially when this arousal is high, um, can actually facilitate performance um, across a variety of domains. The third area uh, that we know both from the psychological literature and that was expressed in these focus groups involved flagging motivation. And one of the things that we know about flagging motivation is that renewing one's sense of purpose about why one is pursuing a particular uh, uh, task, um, a difficult and challenging task, uh, can actually lead to enhanced motivation. So it can actually re-engage motivation, enhance attention. 
And the strategy of reminding oneself about one's ultimate goal and purpose can actually increase persistence performance among college students. Um, and so too with law students and applicants, we'll see, um, especially when students' purposes are pro-social. Um, so uh, over time, over the last five years or so, we've done a variety of uh, studies and surveys, um, and we've really come to develop this diagram uh, for thinking about what the experience of bar exam performance is like and how it plays out with these kinds of mindset worries and concerns. So on the left axis, you'll see confidence. On the bottom axis, you'll see time. And the basic idea is that there can be this vicious cycle when challenges are encountered in law school, this can trigger beliefs and worries about what's going to happen when someone is sitting to take, preparing to take the bar exam and whether they're gonna have what it takes to do well. The high stakes nature of the exam itself actually lead to compounding worries along the way. Students will make many mistakes. In fact, the idea is that they're gonna make mistakes so they can learn from them uh, on these multiple choice and essays, but, uh, these can also compound these worries uh, um, about whether one has the ability to do well in this context, leading to stress during the summer, especially closer um, in June timeframe, for example, and there can be this flagging motivation. We also saw, by the way, about the middle of the summer, there's a, um, a practice multiple choice exam that many, many applicants take, few do well on, and there's a lot of meaning that's made about midsummer. Um, about uh, whether one's going to be able to complete the summer well. So drawing on these insights, we designed the Bar Strategies and Stories program, and we are so incredibly grateful to have partnered with the State Bar of California to receive funding from Access Lex Institute and to receive um, a lot of insights and, and information from the Law School Survey of Student Engagement to better learn about some of these processes as well. We're truly grateful for the support. The basic idea is that um, we have an initial recruitment process that takes place in March, uh, the third year for many students when they're beginning to apply for um, the bar exam over the summer, say. Um, and then when students graduate right, uh, right as they're beginning to study for the exam, uh, we provide our on, brief online intervention that can help draw and provide uh, different meanings and different interpretations about some of these common challenges that many bar test takers experience. Um, the program itself is th th theoretically and empirically grounded. It was IRB approved and designed for US law school graduates preparing for the bar exam. Um, it's a 45 minute program. It's it was delivered online now in 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2021. Initially designed as an RCT. Um, and uh, Later in time, uh, given the uh, promising, really promising results uh, that we um, garnered uh, from the RCT, um, after the first two years, it was clear that we needed to provide the treatment to everyone, and we began doing that. Um, and I put pending next to 2021 because we're still waiting to analyze July 2021 results. We have February 2021, and I'll be talking about that in a moment. Um, so uh, um, uh, what is the program itself? Essentially, the program is organized, the treatment is organized around these three themes, uh, this growth mindset idea, mistakes are common at first and help identify where more effort is needed. Uh, there is a stress, adaptive stress reappraisal component. Stress is useful to reach per peak performance. And there is a purpose component as well to help deal with that flagging motivation. So reminding oneself about one's purpose um, during the summer, later in the summer, especially when there's many different things that are possible to be done, can help recenter, renew the, the focus and lead to that uh, additional studying. Um, applicants are presented with a, su a summary of surveys of prior bar test takers that have stories um, about the common challenges that occur, the potential interpretations that were first made, and then more adaptive ways of thinking about it, new interpretations, construals that can really take hold. Um, and there's nine representative stories. I'll give you a quick example of just um, um, two of these. Um, and the basic idea here is that you can see um, the common experience that's quite challenging is receiving this first practice test results um, over the middle of the summer. This, uh, this feedback can lead to worry that someone will never be able to pass because they only got 45% of these questions right, for example. 
And each of these mistakes across each of these domains can feel like a sign that someone's just not cut out for this and doesn't have what it takes to do well. Um, this applicant then goes to uh, speak with others and learns from someone who took the exam last year and learns that actually everyone struggles at first, especially on that uh, practice test. Everyone does well, but the big key is letting one's mistakes show one where they need to go deeper with the material and learning from those mistakes, using them to spotlight. And truly that uh, the success that's possible on this bar exam is going to come from learning from one's mistakes. Um, that's the first story. The second story has more to do with stress. And it is this very common experience about feeling this arousal over the summer, this stress. Um, and then worries about stressing about the stress. And here, what you'll see is that um, this uh, applicant then reaches out to, to uh, speak with a sister, her sister and learns about uh, different ways of thinking about stress. And that stress, the right kind and the right amounts, can actually boost performance. It can actually um, electrify. It can it can be one's it can be a body's way of rising to meet challenges to help accomplish something that you care about. Um, and so it's useful to harness this kind of stress to help study for the bar. That gives you a sense of what this is about. There's the nine stories. And then I think incredibly importantly, the students then write essays about how this process is true for them and can be helpful for future test takers and letters to future test takers. They effectively take on the role of benefactors in how this can be helpful and sharing this with others. And this really connects with their own experiences and let them advocate the message uh, to this other audience. And we think this is an important ingredient for what actually allows these new interpretations, these new controls to take root. Um, again, it's a brief program that's delivered online after graduation. All right, so now uh, some of you may be familiar with a program based on my last uh, presentation. Um, now we're gonna be presenting some new results. So these are results that look across all time of the program. Again, uh, the 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021 that I was talking about um, a moment ago. So let's, uh, let's get started particularly with the overall results first, then we'll move on to different groups of test takers. Okay, um, the first thing to know, uh, what you'll see here, uh, this is what's called a density plot, and we have total score um, on the x-axis. Um, what you see here is that across the exams that are included in this analysis, July 2018, July 2019, October 2020, and February 2021, um, there's one big takeaway point here. Um, oh, I should say, if you're wondering what these five lines are that are going down the middle of the page, the red line is the 1440 cut score threshold. The blue line is the 1390 cut score threshold. The, the next three are 1350, 1330, 1300, respectively. And so what you'll see is that these cohorts actually demonstrate a considerable variability. It really uh, um, simply the kind of cohort level variability can actually shift the mean of the total score. And depending on where that cut score is, can have a pretty large effect on what that pass rate is going to be. I mentioned this because the analysis that we're going to then provide collapses across all these four categories um, to show uh, four years to show you the results. Here are the overall results of the program on bar exam scores. So what you see is on the left, there's the control group that has a average total score controlling for prior performance like LSAT and law school grades and these cohort differences that I just mentioned about has a, um, an average estimated mean score of 1435. Whereas the treatment has an average estimated score of 1467 which means that the program lifts total scores by 30 points, so about 30 points. Um, and what you can see is that is there's a lot of movement, particularly when we're looking at the 1440 cut score. Um, it straddles this, but you can also see that, um, uh, that both the control and the treatment condition are above um, uh, are above the 1390 mean. And we'll mention this on pass rates now, okay, so here what we see 
on these overall results. Um, and what I, I've depicted on the x-axis at the bottom of the page are various cut scores. So if the cut score is 1440, if it's 1390, if it's 1350, 1330, 1300, there's going to be different pass rates. And what you can see is in the blue and the red line, we have the control condition. These are, I should say, uh, people who did not participate in the program. Whereas the treatment condition are people who have fully completed the program. And what we see is that there's a 12% 12, 12 gap. There's a 12% difference in estimated pass rates um, at the 1440 score. And you can also see that there is a considerable pass rate benefit of 9% at 1390, and that the benefit continues effectively across all ranges of these exam thresholds. So in effect, what you see is that the, uh, the treatment, the program provides a boost to those who complete the program effectively, and regardless of where the pass rate is. Um, you can also see, by the way, that there is a combined benefit of both the, sh the recent shift in the cut score and the program, when we see the prior uh, pass rate at 50%, we now see a pass rate that's possible of 73% in the treatment. Again, these are participants who uh, enrolled and fully completed the program, and we're comparing those uh, who did not participate in the program here. Okay. Um, we also found benefits across diverse groups of bar test takers. The first thing that we're going to do is I'm going to talk about some of the variability that we see in, in, among these diverse groups, and then we're going to collapse across them, and then I'll show you some of these results. Okay, so first, I'm going to orient you here. What you see here is total score on the bottom. Again, the five lines that I mentioned previously, the red being 1440, the blue being 1390, the three black lines being 1350, 1330, and 1300. And what you see here are the heaps of data across these four years for these different demographic groups. And um, what you see is there's considerable variability between racial and ethnic groups of test takers um, with, for example, um, black and Hispanic test takers having means that are on the left of that 1390. And you have white test takers who are uh, further to the right. Okay, so you see variability among, uh, among racial and ethnic group. Here, what we're seeing um, is variability uh, among first gen college status um, applicants and continuing gen applicants. Oftentimes in the literature, this is thought of as a socioeconomic status type uh, indicator. So what we see is first gen college students being to the left and continuing gen being to the right. We then collapsed across these two categories to create a category for advantage and disadvantage test takers as is commonly done in the social psychological ed and sociological literature. The idea is that advantage test takers are white and continuing first gen test takers and the disadvantaged test takers are people of color or first gen white test takers. And we can see pretty considerable uh, differences uh, between the groups here, okay? This is just where we're started before talking about the program. Okay, so now let's take a look at uh, the effects of the program on these different groups. So orienting you here, starting from the left, we see that across these four years in the control group, meaning those who did not participate in the program, the estimated mean after controlling for prior performance like LSAT and LGPA in these cohorts, was 1406, and that the disadvantaged group test, uh, make test takers who participated in the program had about a 30-point increase in their um, uh, predicted total score. We then turn to the advantaged test takers, and you can also see there, too, that advantaged test takers also received a notable benefit from the program. Um, one thing to note is that for advantage test takers, there are many of them in this group were already doing much higher than the 1440 cut score. So they may not have seen as big of a benefit of the program when it comes to passing pass rates at the 1440 since so many of them done well, but everyone seems to be receiving the benefit in terms of total scores. Um, and to essentially encapsulate this, 
what we see here um, is the effect of the program for both advantage and disadvantage test takers across these various cut scores. And what we saw is looking at the 1440 score, which is where we began um, in 2018, we see that for disadvantaged test takers participating and fully completing the program relative to those who did not, we see a 14% bump in the estimated pass percentages for these group. We also see um, an increase for advantaged group members. It's less, recall that with greater percentages of applicants already passing the bar at that state, there's going to be a little bit less of an a, of effect there. When we turn to 1390, we still see the effects of the program. Um, and a, a few things to note, we really can begin to see the cumulative and a combined effect of both having the program and these recent ch changes in the cut scores. For example, just looking at disadvantaged test takers, for example, um, had there not been a cut score change, had there not been the program, the pass rate may have been uh, around 40% across all this, uh, these, these cohorts uh, taken together. But for the, the disadvantaged test takers who fully completed the program under the new cut score, the pass rate's at 64%, meaning there's a pretty considerable benefit of, uh, of both these, these kinds of programs. All right, I hope that that was helpful. I'm going to summarize now um, some of these, these main points. First, there is variation in performance across cohort years of test takers and considerable variability among test takers by race and ethnicity, first gen, continuing gen, advantage, and disadvantage status. Now, the program improves total scores by 30 points and increases passage rates at multiple exam score thresholds. And for both disadvantage and advantage test takers, the program improves estimated total scores by about 30 points and enhances pass rates across exam score threshold, which is really exciting. This is an online brief program that provides the opportunity to reach many test takers when studying for the bar exam. Again, it's tailored to address the psychological friction created by these common challenges that test takers experience when preparing for the bar exam. And it seems especially helpful for underrepresented populations, um, given that uh, they, uh, on balance, would uh, not perform as well um, as advantaged populations. And so this additional benefit can actually lead to uh, some enhanced, enhanced benefits on, the, uh, on, on these passing thresholds. Um, it's also notable to point out the combined effect of uh, both the changes in recent exam score thresholds um, and making the program available, there is a, a combined effect that's quite, uh, quite notable uh, for those who are actually um, taking part in the program and have com completed it. So with that, I wanted to say uh, a few just takeaways in general. The meaning that we shape, uh, the meaning that we make shapes motivation and performance in the bar exam. Growth mindsets are incredibly important to deal with the psychological friction, as is our uh, adaptive theories around stress, reminding oneself about the purpose of why one's doing, uh, and also uh, 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 theories around belonging as well. Um, so we find support that this psychological construals, these mindsets can be uh, uh, greatly important that matter a great deal, uh, especially when facing adversity on these high stakes exams. And we're truly grateful to have been able to present these combined results today. Thank you. If there's any questions, I'd be uh, happy to take them. Hi, uh, Victor. My name is Kareem Gungora. I, I want to first thank you for your presentation and thank you for your team's work. Um, into this really important topic and subject. Um, I come from an underrepresented and disadvantaged community. And so a lot of my um, background in education and exposure to um, student achievement and, and excelling um, is rooted in kind of what you researched. I, I am interested, uh, I, I think I saw it, um, you made an analysis on socioeconomic status or was it on um, race, I believe. And did you find a correlation that, that this uh, program that the bar um, administers 
provides them an additional um, edge. And, and I noticed that you did a, a analysis of pre cut score at 1440 and then as it's at its new cut score. So did that um, achievement dip or did it continue to excel? Oh, you're on mute. Let's go back. Uh, okay, so just a second, let me play from the current slide. Okay, I think this uh, this figure is quite uh, quite helpful, actually. Um, so uh, what one can see um, is that um, there are these notable differences between groups uh, of test takers, uh, between um, uh, test takers based on race and ethnicity and SES status. We've combined that, by the way, to create these categories, advantage and disadvantage. And you can see that um, in the control condition, for example, in the Victor, red and blue condition. Yes. So, Victor, I don't mean to interrupt you, but um, you're not uh, displaying your screen. So I, we're not oh, seeing what you're I, seeing. I sometimes do this, this professor thing. I'm sorry. No okay, here, here goes. Um, all right. Slideshow play from current slide. Okay, so you know what you can see is that um, as I've mentioned, we've created these categories, um, and looking at the uh, the two um, you know the control the two control categories, which are the red and blue lines, um, you'll see some pretty notable differences in pass rates across this th these periods of time. You can also see, by the way, that the cut score, given where these these heaps are has a pretty pronounced effect um, on, on, on pass rates. And it would seem that the pass rate, it has a more pronounced effect um, on disadvantaged group members um, because uh, so many of them are um, not yet passing the bar exam. Whereas for advantaged test takers, um, if the whole, if the heap is by and large already passing the bar exam, you, you'll start to see that kind of, um, uh, it starts to, um, uh, the increase in passage probability starts to kind of narrow. It starts to kind of uh, uh, soften, but it's because so many are already passing the bar exam. So that has that kind of reveals an aspect of cut scores. But the uh, the program differences are between the red and green lines, and you can see effectively what ends up happening is um, when uh, we we still see an effect of the program no matter where the cut score is. Um, but the, uh, the combined effect of the cut score can begin to narrow depending on where that cut score is set effectively um, um, uh, as, you know, as we move to the 80s and 90 percentiles uh, or the high 80s and 90s percentiles, we're starting to look at a smaller, a smaller uh, program benefit. And that's because what, we're, what the program does is effectively it helps push people across the pass threshold Right, um, and when there's more people to be pushed, there's a higher boost. That's the idea. Thank you for that, Victor. By any chance, did you uh, look at repeat test takers versus first-time test takers? Um, I'm happy to to talk um, uh, uh, about that. Uh, the uh, we uh, see, for example, um, that uh, from uh, our one can do analyses, and what one sees over time is that. Uh, you know, as we already know, repeat test takers, there's variability in pass rates between first first time test takers and repeat test takers too. Um, and so we can you can model that much like you've done with the first gen and continuing gen status as well, um, or or the other categories. Awesome. And then my last question is, how do you foresee this um, informing um, us as an entity and maybe even law schools? Um, of course, we're seeing success with this program, but I think you just mentioned that there's probably a peak that ar arrives. Um, um, and so I'm, I'm wondering uh, what, what the next steps you believe and your team believes would, would be uh, with this research. Uh, uh, so um, at present, what we're doing is we're, um, we're aspiring and hoping to make the program available to um, other states, for example. Um, we're incredibly grateful to have worked and to continue to work with the State Bar of California. Um, over time, there's other state bars that have um, asked us to make the program available to them. Um, and so we're working um, already with uh, Colorado and Utah and in discussions with other states. Um, 
And um, we are designing similar programs uh, for uh, law schools as well uh, in the transition uh, into law school. That's something that Dr. Anita Kim and Dr. Ehrman have been working very uh, much on. Um, and um, we, uh, we hope that uh, some of the information that we've collected um, and the analysis that are possible um, could be um, could be done to, to to benefit the state bar of California. So we're you know we're uh, one of the things that we envision is um, being able to answer questions like the kind that you're asking um, with some of the data that we have, and that's something that we have done over time, and we continue to uh, uh, look forward to being able to do. Yes, uh, I have a question, uh, Victor. This is Vince Reyes. Uh, congratulations to uh, you and the team. This is a tremendous. Uh, insight uh, in terms of uh, strategies for uh, helping people to succeed. Um, my question is this, I, I have a, a background in, in affirmative action from, from way, way back. And a lot of times uh, institutions were happy just to get people in. Uh, and once they were in, they were looked at as numbers and not necessarily given uh, strategies, as you're putting it, to be able to get supported and to stay in and to succeed. So a lot of times there's people who are just fish out of water in a, a, an environment that was hard to get into and then increasingly difficult to stay into. So uh, I know you're just scratching the surface, but your program itself, um, when people sign up for it, uh, what types of personal assistance do they get? And is it tailored to the different types of uh, groups you're talking about, uh, you know, whether it's ethnic or religious or uh, socioeconomic background, uh, immigrant background, et cetera? Are you able to talk a little bit about that? Um, so um, I think. Um, one there's there's really there's two one is. Um, I know that Sam, I see Sam's on the call um, and Sam's thought a lot about these kinds of questions, particularly in law schools and how some of these kinds of techniques can be used in, in law schools. Um, maybe Sam, you, you could kind of, I'll, I'll hand it to you. You could briefly talk about uh, some of what you're thinking there and then um, I'll have a few things to say as well, okay? Sure, um, thanks, Victor. So the part of the, in, the goal of our work is to open up the pipeline into legal practice from the early stages through entry and beyond. And the leaking out of the pipeline and the blockages that you encounter um, can differ at different stages. So we've been trying, um, Dr. Kim and I, to um, build a program you could do for incoming law students that would help them hit the ground running when they got to the law school. And there we've been focusing a bit more on questions of belonging, on the notion some people or many people arrive at law school and wonder, am I gonna fit in here? Do people like me thrive here? And so trying to tell them essentially like go through exercises that help them to see that feeling out of place is normal. These questions are normal, but they're also temporary for most people. Um, and that they've arrived at an institution that does want them to thrive and that does and will support them in various ways. And the hope is that like the bar exam program, um, these, the pilot will then mature into something that we could roll out across multiple law schools. Um, and so just to, um, uh, and just to, to, to emphasize, so, uh, and I think this goes to your question, the idea that, um, that it's not enough to simply um, admit students, uh, but it's about uh, um, uh, ensuring that the, uh, the climate, the environment, and the experiences are conducive to their success, right? And thriving in those environments. And that's, uh, that's something that Sam, uh, Sam has been uh, uh, very mindful of with, with uh, Dr. Anita Kim and, and, and working on these programs. And then I, I wanna say that the, the program itself, one of the things that it does here is we mentioned um, the surveys of prior test takers and also the questions, um, the stories themselves, but the stories are attributed to a, a diverse group of applicants, basically. And so you kind of, the stories themselves are written from these multiple different perspectives. 
And so what we find is that students tend to, uh, test takers tend to um, see in the stories something about them too. Uh, and they, they can kind of use that as well. Um, uh, um, I, I, I also see, by the way, that um, Leo Wilson is on the call. And I just wanted to say uh, so incredible thanks because one of the things that the video begins with is a welcome, a, a welcome message uh, by um, the executive director of the State Bar of California. And I think that goes um, an incredibly long way. Um, uh, and um, so I just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, but between the, the welcome message, uh, some kind of upbeat music and videos that show a, a, a kind of a dirt, diverse set of uh, law students and lawyers, um, and then the, the stories being attributed to many different kinds of, of, of applicants, um, I think that what ends up happening is that creates the scaffolding for test takers to see in other stories something within their own story and then they go and write and it becomes their, their own basically. Yeah, well, th thank you for these responses. I think it opens up uh, a lot of uh, opportunity for people who just are getting to law school. It's so difficult for them to get there and some support, but it opens up other avenues for other types of people and different types of professions to get involved with uh, what you're doing. So um, I, I really, uh, you know, I th to me, you're creating a really wonderful platform uh, to start. Hi, uh, this is uh, Michael Cow. Um, I wanted to really applaud um, you and your team for doing such a wonderful job. Uh, I echo the same sentiments as Kareem and Vince as well, too. Um, my background is I was actually a former full-time faculty at the Keck School of Medicine. So I was just curious, um, from a scientific standpoint, um, when you uh, created the study, uh, did you envision increasing the power of your N of 205? And then subsequently, what was your primary and secondary uh, endpoints that were predefined? And how do you uh, improve upon that since you're going to be expanding it out to additional states uh, with that. Um, I, I think your study is, is, is fantastic that uh, your p-values are less than 0.05 and that you can increase their test scores by greater than 30 points, which is phenomenal because uh, this is really high stakes exams. So I, I really applaud that. I was just curious about those couple questions I had. Uh, um... So talking about the design perspective, um, in developing the program, we applied a, a mixed methods approach. So partially through the focus groups, right? Learning through the themes, uh, but then also the surveys themselves. And as you point out, it was, about, it was about 200 or so. And even in there, you could really start to begin to assess these kinds of correlations, right? You start to see them, they just come. Um, and so based on that, uh, those two sources uh, helped us identify these levers that were also present within the literature. Then what we ended up doing um, is we, in the first two years, developed this as a randomized control trial. Um, so we essentially had the treatment condition um, and the control condition. The treatment condition, effectively the program, the control condition, and active studies program um, and um, what we learned, I should say Nadim is also on the call. Nadim is um, teaching statistics at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. Um, and he's also a, a Harvard fellow working on a number of projects in California involving the digital divide. Um, but he developed a randomization protocol uh, that effectively allowed us to randomize but equal with equal weight for uh, different kind of group statuses. So ensuring that we had the same number of men same number of same percentages of men and women, same percentages of various racial and ethnic groups, first gen and continuing gen, trying to kind of make sure the randomization process also ensures prior performance is about. Then we analyzed over the first two years, and it became pretty clear that uh, people who sign up for the bar exam, we're talking about US uh, applicants taking uh, signing up for the bar exam who um, you know, timely enroll and finish our, the program, you can see these, these differences. Um, and uh, they were so present then uh, that in later years, we 
remove the control condition, made the treatment condition available to everyone, and then effectively looked at the differences between the treatment and those who didn't participate. Um, and then it became pretty pronounced um, uh, as well. And so, um, uh, so in terms of current, we feel like we have a, a, a great deal of information. We're actually preparing a, um, a publication to go into perhaps science, we're, we're submitting it. Uh, and we're also uh, doing another publication that kind of combines across time, um, like we've done here. Um, and then going forward, um, it's doing similar analyses as we roll out to additional states. We have ideas for improving the program and developing boosters. I know it's kind of, this, there's a lot of talk about boosters right now in the world, but we're talking about boosters for a psychological booster. Um, and so the idea is that sending, a, sending to the applicant a sample of some of the stories and perhaps one of theirs closer to the exam and that kind of keeps it fresh and helps with that motivation at the very end. So we're, that could be done as an RC. This is probably way too much information, but I just thought I'd kind of like provide a little bit of it, um, but that's kind of some of our, our planning. Yeah. And I, can I just chime in and say that the N equals, N equals 205 refers to the survey that we did in advance of administering the program, but the analyses that we presented today collapse across several years. And so we're talking about uh, and Nadine would know better than this, but I mean, much more than 205, uh, 1,000 per group, at least. Actually, uh, 1,000, yeah. So across years, we have like over 8,000 participants, but yeah. when we look at the like subgroups, I think it drops about to like 750 minimum. Mm -hmm. So we have enough power to run the statistical analysis. Yeah. I have a question or um, more uh, line of inquiry. Um, first, I apologize to all the um, other community members. I may sound like a broken clock at this point, but uh, I'm glad to actually be able to talk um, with the group and community Victor. So I'm honored for that. Um, my main, I'll present my question, then a quick brief summary to add context to the question and then repeat the question. Um, I thought what well, you presented is amazing, but I am very, um, not skeptical, but concerned that um, there wasn't any focus or any conversation or analysis on individuals with disabilities, whether mental or physical. And that's something in which is very indicative for law students um, based on my own experience. And most specifically based on this people's misassumptions, uh, if that's the proper terminology, in terms of um, not understanding that one can develop mental anxieties over time, um, such as the bar exam, but most specifically in one point and it will be 2020 the entire year. Um, in regards to the uh, context, I, you know, I graduate summa cum laude from UC Berkeley in the legal studies program, applied to law schools. I know this is a public forum in recording, so I have to be very specific in terms of redaction. But I was specifically told by two deans of information that I will never be able to pass a bar exam. That's why they're going to prohibit me from attending the law school. And in fact, it took me three times of applying to law schools three years cycles just to get into two out of 17 law schools. The extreme implicit bias against individuals with disabilities is massive in the legal field and it's highly reflective in terms of the current status of what 0. 0.4, 0. 0.3% of individuals or attorneys with disabilities in the legal field and practice. Compare that to who in the United States census stats of 20% of individuals have a disability. This is more systematic to higher education in general, but it's also very systematic to just the complete ousting of neurodiversity in the legal profession. In regards to my own personal journey, I passed the bar exam on my first time because I followed the Gattaca approach of never save anything for the swim back. Oh, the Forrest Gump approach of just keep going, keep running. 
Um, it's the whole, I'm a, not really a fluke. I know other individuals struggle with it. Yet it comes down to the need of accommodating different anxieties, mental outlets, different ways of doing it. Sometimes this program might be well suited, but it could be just overwhelming. Uh, I won't go into whether or not it's ADA compliant, I'm sure it is, but it's also just whether or not if it's just suitable for individuals with both mental and physical disabilities, which might be more indicative of the bar exam results itself, but we never have the studies to look at it. Um, regardless, I was able to pass the bar exam on my first time because I study, and not to say other people have it. And from that, it actually led me to actually uh, develop bar exam study apps that I have to decommission because the California Supreme Court appointed me to serve on this committee. But I hawk in back to the need for normal diversity, and I'm hoping that this program can accommodate or at least explore whether or not no diversity can be uh, incorporated into a psychological and mental welfare program to increase the results. The last thing I'll note will be um, the need for normal diversity. I have an extremely strong tech background. And if I was pushed, if I had listened to the advice of the, those two deans of law school saying, I will never pass a bar exam, that's why they won't let me in, then I wanna be here today. And more importantly, and this is, I hit, it's not self-promoting, but this is just accomplishments. I'm on this committee, as well as I've been classified by Google as a unicorn because they never met an attorney who can outprogram the programmers. And that's just because of sheer perseverance and determination. Those are factors like in Gattaca and Forrest Gump for sure, but those are the hurdles that I can see individuals going through. And those are the same hurdles that you're exploring with this committee. So I'm just asking, or not really asking, but inquiring um, the need for neurodiversity, but also just understanding can this program be incorporating to law students with disabilities and at least understanding their path and hopefully future success in the legal field. So first off, I wanted to say um, congratulations, Michael. Um, it's, it's truly um, wonderful that you were able to uh, accomplish the many things that you were accomplished. And I do think the themes that you raise are incredibly important around neurodiversity. I think there could be, by the way, a larger discussion about the importance of neurodiversity for the legal profession writ large and then thinking about um, what can be done to ensure that that neurodiversity takes place. Um, what I'll say about the program is I think that there's, um, there's potential areas where that could come. Uh, there's a few things. One is the program takes common cause in a lot of ways with work on welfare uh, in kind of thinking about um, uh, human health and, and kind of well-being. Um, the second is that it has a, uh, it really addresses at least some of the antecedents of mental uh, distress and anxiety by thinking about these uh, stress interventions. But I, I will say that um, the kind of work that Sam has spoken about around social belonging, for example, um, I think could be incredibly important for thinking about neurodiverse individuals as they go on to law school and enter new domains. So there's, there's the possibility, and I wanted to say thank you for bringing this to our attention, um, because I could see how that could be designed um, to uh, to be, um, uh, to be space for um, individuals with um, neurodiverse um, uh, aspects to be able to uh, create a sense of belonging um, as they move into these, these new domains. So I wanted to say thank you. OK, 
Doctor, I had a quick follow up question. Um, it sounds like you have submitted um, uh, for uh, publication in a, a journal of some sort, but um, do you have any uh, write ups now that perhaps we could share with the committee? Um, you know, on uh, on this initiative itself. Um, I know you're probably like in your, in your fourth year of, uh, you know, conducting this with the bar exam, um, but it might be interesting to know a little bit about how much the content of the initiative itself has um, uh, perhaps morphed or developed. Um, but is there anywhere that we could find this in like a written publication? Um, I'm happy to send them your way. So we have okay. uh, we have reported some of kind of the milestone or, uh, kind of initial results. What I just presented to you today, the four year milestone is literally um, something that we've completed this summer. So it's not yet uh, in a publication. I can share the PowerPoint for sure. Um, okay. um, and there are other uh, publications uh, that I that I can share about some of the themes that we've discussed as well. I'm happy. I, I'm happy to follow up on an email and send you anything that you think would be useful. All right, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for your presentation. And if there aren't any other questions or comments, um, I think we can move on to. Ed Sanders. Thank you very much for your very informative presentation. I think everyone learned a lot from it. Thank you. Esther, for really, thank you. Uh, Esther, really quickly, I just wanted to thank um, the bar staff as well for um, calling for this type of research. I know it's been years in the making and we've all been patiently waiting, um, but I definitely want to give a kudos to the team uh, for also providing that support. I'll uh, I'll second that um, and just say thank you. Um, it's been really uh, we're really grateful to have worked with Leah, with Tara, uh, with with Amy um, uh, along the way, um, and um, Ron Ron as well. Um, so many. Um, I could go on. <laughs> You've seen enough of me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So right now let's move on to Ed Standards, and after Ed Standards, I think it'll probably be our lunch break. So um, Paul and Natalie. Okay, so you've given us an hour and a half then, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, the first item is action on the uh, minimum cumulative five-year bar exam pass rate, what we call the MPR compliance reporting for accredited law schools. That's uh, 0400. Um, for those new to this, the MPR is uh, calculated by dividing the number of law school graduates during a defined five-year window who pass the bar by those who take the exam one or more times during that same window, but uh, do not pass it. Uh, well, the total number of takers, regardless of whether they passed or failed. Um, this last uh, April, we adjusted the formula to account for graduates who participate in the alternate pathway program set up last year, uh, who may never uh, take the bar again, but become bar members by virtue of their participation in the program. Uh, the schools report every year their numbers by July 1st, and uh, staff this year worked with them to adjust for alternative pathway participants as was necessary. You'll see the results on page five of the PDF file. Across the board, uh, the NPR has increased. Um, that's a good thing. Uh, some by um, almost 10 points, others by a fraction of a point, but nobody um, had a lower NPR from this year in comparison to last year. Um, uh, staff is requesting our authorization to post the results on the BARS website and the appropriate motion to do that is on page three of the uh, PDF and I assume Natalie or somebody will be putting that up on the screen in a moment. Um, uh, does anyone have any particular specific questions or general questions about uh, this item? Okay, so that's um, on the screen now is the appropriate motion. Um, uh, does anyone wish to make that or some other motion? Hi, this is uh, Michael. Um, I'd like to go ahead and make that motion. Uh, second. 
James Bolton second. Okay, roll call, Kim. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Dr. Kao? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Gongora? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Ms. Heisinger? Judge Herman? Yes. Sorry. Judge Herman? Yes. Mr. Isari? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Dr. Wilkinson? Yes. The motion passes. Okay, the next item is 0401. Um, and that's a discussion of the continuation of probation for San Francisco Law School due to um, non-compliance with the MPR requirement. Uh, this and the next two items share some common facts, so I'm just going to state them once um, so I can keep it under an hour and a half. Um, the law schools reported NPRs last year that were below 40%. And in January of this year, we placed them on probation, requiring that they come into compliance by reporting an, an NPR of 40% or greater by uh, 2022. In other words, next year's report. While San Francisco Law School's NPR has improved, it went up from 36 to 39%. It does remain out of compliance. And it is recommended that we continue the previously set probation and also um, be more specific about the notice of probationary status that the school must give in the interim. Uh, and a motion to that effect is found at pages three and four of the PDF and I'm sure will appear on our screen shortly. Does anyone have any questions? I'll note that uh, Dean Timothy Weiner was expected to be available for questions if there are any. And then there's one other aspect of this that's um, because we set the probation at, to end on July 1st, um, we're not gonna be able to, to formally consider um, what to do about that until our August meeting. Uh, because the uh, NPR need not be reported until July 1st. So some point next year, um, perhaps in April, there will be an agenda item for um, the two schools that we are continuing probation for, just setting a, uh, giving notice that we intend to consider their status in August and to make sure that their stat there's no question about the status of their status, if you will, we will probably extend the probation until somewhere around the end of August, so that will allow us time to, to take those steps that are the necessary next steps in this process. So once more, any questions or comments? Um, somebody wanna make the motion? So moved. Dolores, thank you, second? I'll second that, this is Michael. Thank you, Michael. Um, Kim? Dr. Bolton? Yes. Dr. Kao? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Gongora? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Judge Herman? Yes. Mr. Iseri? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. And Dr. Wilkinson? Yes. The motion passes. Okay, the next item is 0402. This is for Lincoln Law School of San Jose. Uh, situation similar to San Francisco Law Schools. Um, its NPR increased from 31.5 to 36.5%. Again, still below the required 40%. Um, the same recommendation is made to continue the probation and specify the form of, the, form of notice to be given in the interim, uh, found again on pages three and four of the report. Um, I'll note that uh, Lincoln uh, sent a comment letter in on um, August 10th, and it was distributed to us. Um, 
indicating that they felt that they were on track with the compliance plan that they had submitted to us in January, and they expect to be compliant when they report their MPR next year. Uh, Carlos Singh and Tan Do uh, may be present uh, as attendees to answer any questions if there are any. So are there any questions or comments? Uh, Paul, just to clarify, I did see the uh, letter come in. I believe they're within a couple percentage points. I can't remember the top of my head. Uh, but the next reporting period would be next year, correct? Yeah, we just uh, have the report once a year. So um, it'll be uh, uh, required by next, next uh, July, July 1st. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do you want to put up the motion? I'll, I'll move to um, approve staff recommendation. This is Kareem. Do I have a second? This is Michael again. I'll second that. Thank you. Kim? Dr. Bolton? Yes. Dr. Cobb? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. Mr. Efting? Oh, sorry, yes. Mr. Gongora? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Dr. Herman? Yes. Mr. Isari? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Rios? Yes. Dr. Wilkinson? Yes. The motion passes. Okay. Um, going forward, just for the benefit of anybody calling in rather than joining us over Zoom, if you could just go ahead and read the motion before um, the motion uh, before we go to vote on the motion, that would be great. Ooh, the whole point of doing this was to, to avoid that. Um, I know, but it, it does, it, it makes it difficult if you're calling in by phone to know exactly what the committee um, action being taken is. Of course, it's later posted in the minutes and you know there are other ways, but still it's well, best and it, practice. We'll try to keep the motion short on our <laughs> Well, we can't always screens. we can't always do that. Um, but uh, does it does it help you that the motion was contained in the written materials that were posted and are available for people to review? I think that absolutely helps the public to see what the committee action is. Um, but anyway, it's best practice just to read it as well. So okay. Um, well, we'll do it on the next one then, which I think is shorter. Um, Okay, and the next item is 0403, and that uh, relates to consideration of termination of probation for the John F. Kennedy School of Law at North Central University, uh, again, regarding noncompliance with the NPR requirement. Uh, JFK successfully raised their NPR. It was 39.7%, which was pretty close last year, but they have raised it to 41.9%, um, which is now um, compliant. And so having satisfied that requirement of its probation, it is appropriate for the committee to terminate the probation. Um, we made it clear when we imposed it that um, there would be no automatic termination. The committee would have to review um, the data and that's what we're doing today. Um, and then we would take formal action to terminate it if it was appropriate. So there is a motion to that effect. It's found on page two of the, um, the staff report. And uh, Lisa Hutton may be present to answer any questions you may have of the school if you do. Um, so do we have any questions or comments? If not- uh, I, would, I would move that the Committee of Bar Examiner finds that John F. Kennedy School of Law at North Central University has minutes terms of probation and therefore the committee acts to end the law school probation effective immediately. I'll second, I'll second the motion. Okay, we'll give that one to Dolores. Um, on the second, uh, Kim. Dr. Bolton. Yes. Dr. Cow. Yes. Mr. Chen. Yes. Ms. Efting. Yes. Mr. Gongora. Yes. Ms. Heising. Yes. Judge Herman. Yes. Mr. Isari? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Rios? Yes. 
Dr. Wilkinson? Yes. The motion passes. Okay, thank you. Um, this one is, the next one is 0404, action on proposed amendment to new the new rules for accredited law schools, um, specifically the MPR rule at 4.160 sub D uh, sub section six. Um, this is a technical amendment to fully, a technical action to fully implement our modifications to the MPR formula that we made in April. Um, as you recall, back then we changed the guidelines. I, I described it a little bit earlier to um, update the MPR formula to account for participation in the um, alternative pathway portion of the uh, blanket on the acronym for that program. Anyway, uh, and we did that in our guidelines because that's where the MPR formula is for now. But the new um, accredited law school rules are gonna take effect January 1st. And so for 2022 and the following years, the formula is gonna be in those rules, um, no longer in the guidelines. Um, while we have the power to modify guidelines ourselves, it's convenient, we can do things quickly. Uh, the Board of Trustees is the one that adopts the rules. And we therefore need to recommend to them that they modify the rules to incorporate those NPR, um, uh, the changes to the NPR formula to conform it to the changes that we made in our guidelines. Um, uh, they're shown in track changes to the proposal at uh, attachment B at page five of the staff report. And while they're, the language vary, has to vary a little bit um, because um, because uh, now we're talking about looking back at, um, for instance, the October 2020 bar exam. And um, they are, and the intent was to simply conform the rule to the policies that we considered and adopted in April, um, making no changes to that. Where uh, the intent today isn't to revisit what we did, but simply to take the technical step of making sure that it gets into the rules. Um, a motion to make that recommendation is found at page three of the um, staff report. And that's to basically have the trustees adopt, uh, rather um, consider our proposal and then send it out for public comment for uh, the shortest period possible, I believe is 30 days after which they then could approve it. Um, and that by doing this today, we should allow time for it to be in effect by um, January 1st, uh, when the new rules take effect. But any, even if there's a little bit of a delay, they should be able to get it adopted before people have to report their NPRs in uh, June of next year. So do we have any questions or comments? Somebody wish to um, make the motion? Yes, I'll move that the Committee of Bar Examiner recommends that the Board of Trustees post the amendments to Rule 4.160D6 of the new rules for accredited law schools as set forth in Attachment B for a 30-day period of public comment after which they may be considered for modification or approval. Second. I'll second the motion. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, Kim? Dr. Bolton? Yes. Dr. Kao? Yes. Mr. Chen? Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Gongora? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Dr. Herman? Yes. Mr. Iseri? Yes. M Mr. Kaplan? Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Rios? Yes. Dr. Wilkinson? Yes. The motion passes. Okay. Um, next is 0405. That's action on a periodic inspection report of the University of Laverne College of Law. Uh, Laverne transitioned, as you may recall, from ABA accreditation to California accreditation in the last uh, year or so. Um, this is its first inspection set to confirm its compliance with our accreditation standards. 
Its plan is to teach out its 176 ABA students. And it enrolled its first California class in uh, fa the fall of last year, 2020, of approximately 106 students. The inspection was conducted in April of this year by our consultant, Heather Georgiakis and uh, Dolores Heisinger. Uh, the report contains recommended, uh, recommends adoption of four mandatory actions and makes three suggestions to enhance compliance. Um, I won't go into each of them unless you have uh, questions about any of them. Uh, Dean Kevin Marshall is should be present if you have questions for the school. His response, which is an attachment B to the staff report, accepts the recommendations and reports some progress already uh, having been made by the school towards them. Uh, the motion is on page four. I just had a question. I'm not sure I qu quite understood this. So there, are, there were students already in the school before the transition. So the students that were already in their second or third year would remain under the ABA rules? I, it was just confusing to me. Um, I think the most important part is that they would, if they graduate, they would obtain a degree from an ABA law school. So then they could take the bars in many more states than we can. Okay, yeah, yeah. thank you. There may be all kinds of complications about variations in the ABA rules um, between theirs and ours. Staff uh, worked to uh, sort that out and, uh, and in their report, um, they, uh, they believe that um, that will work properly. Uh, do I have that correct, Natalie? That's correct, Paul. And when the team was there, uh, they looked at both aspects and Dolores was part of that team if she would like to make a comment as to her experience at the school and their ability to carry both parallel tracks, which they seem to be very careful to do. Anything to add, Dolores? Yeah. Thank you. Just uh, I'd like to make just a, a couple of comments. Um, I always learn a great deal by participating in the periodic inspections. And I always come away with a, a greater appreciation of all the work that goes into uh, running a law school. Um, in, with, in Laverne's case, I was really especially impressed with uh, just a couple of things. Well, with a lot of things, I'm just gonna mention a couple. Um, I was really impressed with the level of support that they give to their graduates after they, to their students after they graduate and as they prepare for the bar exam. Um, they're giving, the students are given uh, many opportunities to participate in um, postgraduate uh, bar prep programs. And they, the school, I think, makes a tremendous effort of really um, working with the students post-graduation and during that, those summer months to um, help them. Um, the school also has a, a great career development center that helps the students prepare for entering the job market. Um, I was also very impressed with the demographics of the, the school. Um, I believe the school is located down in uh, Kareem's neck of the woods. Um, the demographics show about 59% women and a, a really high percentage of ethnic minorities, especially Latinos. Um, finally, in a Zoom meeting that we held with the students, they really expressed a great deal of satisfaction with the support they received from the school. Um, and the students especially praised the administration and faculty for the efficient uh, handling of the transition to online learning instruction. So a special thanks to um, Heather Georgiakis for leading and preparing the report. She really does an excellent job. Yes, indeed. Um, and, any, any questions or comments? One comment? I, I, oh, go ahead, Michael. I'll go next. No. And this is quick clarification. This is Law One Law School, correct? Yes. Um, no, I heard wonderful things, especially since I was at the Legal Aid Society in the past. My supervisor went to that law school 
uh, graduate uh, years ago before me. So, um, but she told me um, part of the state is during the bar exam that pre-COVID, of course, they had people bringing lunches to all the bar exam people taking it at the Ontario testing sites. And they set up like lunches and drinks during that lunch period. Um, there's a lot of good things. Um, yeah, I am impressed by that story and that she knows other people are still continuing doing that. And I'm not sure if she's still doing it, but it just shows a lot of um, uh, weight to the law school. And that's it. Kareem? Uh, yes, I first want to uh, thank Dolores, uh, thank Natalie, and of course, Heather, um, all amazing people. And thank you for coming to the uh, Ellen Empire-ish, because it's on like the borderline. Uh, but it is one of the only schools, uh, physical locations within a uh, 30 to 45 mile radius of folks who live in Riverside, San Bernardino counties. I know we have the distance schools, but Laverne has been a pretty uh, well-known institution. And so I'm happy uh, that they were able to get to the status. I noticed, I did look in, I look at their NPR and it's looking really good. I think they're at 71%, Natalie? 75. As of 75. Oh, 75%. Okay. So that's very good news. Um, and I'm happy to hear uh, Dolores highlight some of the um, uh, the demographics as well as who's uh, benefiting. I've had a lot of friends graduate and had nothing but positive things. So just wanted to give my comments on that and also thank the team and thank Laverne for um, making those adjustments uh, right away uh, in regards to the recommendations from uh, the inspection team. So uh, no further comments and if there's a motion, I'd be willing to make it. Anyone else have comments? I think I'm gonna try this one in all one breath, Paul. Give me give me some time. Move that the committee of bar examiners receives and files a 2021 periodic inspection of University of Laverne College of Law and the response from the law school accepting the report. And it is further moved that the report's recommendation be adopted that the law school is directed to implement the recommendations and to document the completion with supporting evidence as part of the law school's 2021 annual report. And it is further moved that the accreditation of University of Laverne College of Law be continued and that the law school's next periodic inspection be scheduled for spring 2026 unless an earlier visitation is deemed necessary by the committee. I second it. Kim? Dr. Bolton? Yes. Dr. Kao? Yes. Mr. Chen? Mr. Epstein? Yes. Mr. Gongora? Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Judge Herman? Yes. Mr. Isari? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Rios? Yes. And Dr. Wilkinson? Yes. The motion passes. Did uh, Kareem spoke get recorded? What was that? Did you vote? I didn't hear you. Oh, I, I thought I said yes. I was still catching my breath, though, so you might not have, not have heard me. I was going to say, you must be a singer, Kareem. That was all in one breath. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Thank next you, is, sure. Next is 0406. Um, this is another periodic inspection report, this time of the University of West Los Angeles School of Law. Um, this inspection was also conducted in April this year by our, again, by Heather George Ackes as our consultant and um, Dr. Cal. Uh, this report recommends the adoption of nine mandatory actions and makes two suggestions to enhance compliance. Again, I won't delve into the, the depths of them unless uh, you have questions about any of them. Uh, Dean Jay Frickberg is present. Uh, if you have any questions, or I believe I saw him there earlier anyway. Um, uh, he responded, uh, and it's an attachment B, uh, that the school accepts the recommendations 
and um, has reported uh, some progress already being made by the school uh, towards uh, complying with those recommendations. There is a motion on uh, page um, pages three and four. Um, so, you know, do your exercises, Kareem. Um, but do we have any questions? I don't. I just uh, have to extend my admiration of uh, Dean Frickberg. He's been a really close partner of the bar and has been very helpful and supportive um, to the uh, CBE and uh, the state bar since I've been involved. So just wanted to extend that to uh, Mr. Dean Frickberg. And Dr. Cow, did you want to make any remarks? Um, yes, I would, Pat. Thank you. So, you know, just like what Dolores said, I want to echo her sentiments is that the whole process of the periodic uh, visits is a just phenomenal process from everyone from the staff to the faculty to the students and the dean and the board, uh, how much time and effort that they really want to show uh, how hard the law school works and uh, what they do to make sure that all their students are successful. And um, I really was impressed with, Dr. with uh, Dean Frickberg, how thoughtful and caring he is of his students and his school, um, the board as well. Um, the, the faculty and the students themselves are extremely diversified and uh, they're gonna, they just opened up a second campus. And so I think that that gives more opportunity for more future uh, attorneys to have a pathway uh, to add diversity to the legal field. And, uh, and obviously, as what everyone else had, had noted, is that Heather is just phenomenal with her experience and her professionalism and the way she leads the whole process. Uh, and so um, I really you know, think that uh, uh, Dean Frickberg and, and uh, the University of West LA are, are doing a great job. I just wanted to say that publicly. OK, thanks. Any other comments? I'm going to put up the motion. This is Natalie. I, I wanted to make one other comment about a very unique program uh, that this school has uh, based on some of the comments and increase in ac interest in access to the profession that was discussed earlier. Uh, the school is very committed to providing access uh, to students who have the intent and capacity to study law to the extent that they have a program that's different than any other I've seen. Uh, students that would be uh, more in an opportunity status, maybe first gen learners, maybe had a tough undergraduate experience, et cetera, can take a single readiness for law course at no charge to the student. And that can help determine if they are ready at this time and can help the school to determine the resources they'll need to be successful. And then at the end of that period, the school can determine whether there'll be a full admissions decision. So it's literally a no cost way for the student and the school uh, to explore um, enrollment. And it's been very successful for the law school. Um, and it's especially notable that they're willing to do this at no charge, though it is, of course, a cost to the school. Thanks. You know, we could turn this into a competition, I guess, and we could um, <laughs> vote somebody off the island. Are you going to go for it again, Kareem, just to make sure that you don't have any competition? I'm going to take. I'm going to take a break on this one. Now no one's going to want to make the motion just because they have to read it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Caroline. All right, I'm going at it again, man. Wish me luck. Okay, Move you can take the a break. <laughs> Move that the Committee of Bar Examiners receives and files a 2021 periodic inspection report of University of West Los Angeles and the response from the law school accepting the report. And it is further moved that the report's recommendations be adopted, that the law school is directed to implement the recommendations and to document the completion with supporting evidence as part of the law school's 2021 annual report. And it is further moved that the acc accreditation of University of West Los Angeles be continued and that the law school's next periodic ins inspection be scheduled for spring 2026 unless an earlier visitation is deemed necessary by the committee. Do we have a second? I'll second the motion. This is Vince. Kim? Dr. Bolton? Yes. Dr. Kao? Yes. Mr. Chen? Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Gongora? Yes. Yeah. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Judge Herman? Yes. Mr. Iseri? 
Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Dr. Wilkinson? Yes. The motion passes. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to item 0407. This again is the University of West Los Angeles School of Law. Um, they uh, have filed a major change request to add a, we're calling it a hybrid JD program. Um, what they wanna do is have both a classroom track and an online only track, but with the ability for students to petition to take classes in either track or to transfer between the tracks. So I gather that's where the hybrid label comes. Um, the, the academic calendar, class schedules, and graduation requirements would be the same between the two tracks. Uh, staff has found, uh, they've analyzed in, in their uh, staff report, and they find that the proposed program will comply with the accredited school rules, and they recommend that we approve it. A motion to that um, effect is on pages 405. When somebody reads it, you will see that it includes requirements to let us know when it starts or if there's a delay in the startup of the program, and to provide a comparison of the two tracks in each annual report uh, up until the time of our next inspection, which as we just decided will likely be in uh, 2026. Um, Dean Frickberg, I presume is still around in case we have questions. Um, so do we have any questions or comments? And any questions or comments or um, are we ready for a motion? I do have a quick question. Um, and the only reason why I asked this, uh, if the Dean, if Dean Frickberg is accessible by any chance? Um, can you he promote is him? At, he's in the audience. So would it be possible to promote him uh, so that he can speak? And, and the question is more based to their clinicals. Um, they have a unique, unique way of um, providing those. And so I just wanted him to give a brief um, overview of how that how that's going to work with this new program. Go ahead, uh, Dean Frickberg. Oh, wait, he's still in the attendees list, but he was at the top. He may have uh, fallen off. Oh, I see him. Here Sorry. Uh, they had to promote me. Uh, good morning. Uh, committee, uh, Chair and Vice Chair, uh, thank you for allowing us to speak and be heard. Uh, specifically on the question, uh, we have a very extensive externship program. Uh, we're very practice focused for our students and our program. And specific, what we're discussing is the IEP program, the Individual Educational Program, where we offer a clinic uh, free to our community for individuals with students in LA Unified School Districts specifically that have some type of learning difficulty that has been documented. So that way our students can represent those families in making sure that the LAUSD supplies an appropriate individual educational program. It is overseen by one of our professors, uh, Brown Fletcher, and all of its participants are also formerly known certified law students, now practical uh, experienced law students. So they're certified by the bar as well. And it's a great program that provides a great service to the community and even better service, I believe, to the students themselves as they learn to become advocates. Have you gotten some outside funding for that program? No. Oh, okay. I thought maybe it was available because I've known some people who have done that, but I could be wrong. We're always open to it, though, if there's any options. Well, I, I don't know who to refer you to, but you might just take a look. Definitely will now. Thank you, Dean Frickberg. Um, I appreciate that. that was, that's all I was really asking for. And uh, I appreciate that you provide that service to the community. And I know we've had conversations in the past about how opportunity schools such as yours provide such necessary support. I believe there's also some um, additional clinics you've provided in regards to processing application. Is it expungement or um, going over citizenship paperwork? I I'm not too sure, but I, I remember hearing about those as well. 
Exactly. Um, we're not currently running it. The IEP is still currently running during our COVID time period uh, because LA Unified is running with the IEPs. Uh, we were running an expungement clinic. We'd like to reopen that again. Uh, again, another free service to our community to help people free their documented criminal backgrounds and it helped them with employment and, and again restarting their lives as they should once they pay their back their debt to society uh, separately from that we do have a, a very extensive immigration uh, professor grouping and they volunteer quite often uh, they were going down to the border quite often helping people when we had our emergencies down there thank you those are all my questions and uh, appreciate your work dean thank you Can you put up the motion again? Okay, I'm, I'm not gonna make the motion since I'm the, the chair of the subcommittee, but I'll read it and then somebody can say what he said. Um, moved that the University of West Los Angeles School of Law's request for a major change to add an online JD program as set forth in attachment A breath be received and filed that the request be granted effective immediately and that the following progress reports be required to be filed with the committee one a letter confirming that the start confirming the start date of the program and initial enrollment within 30 days of the program launch or advising the committee by november 1 2021 of any delay in the program's launch and two an annual progress report regarding the online jd program's enrollment and performance as compared to the law school's classroom JD program be included with the law school's annual reports each year until the law school is inspected again. Somebody wanna make that motion? This is uh, Michael, uh, I'd like to make that motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Kim. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Mr. Dr. Carl? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Gongara? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Judge Herman? Yes. Mr. Isari? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Rios? Yes. Dr. Wilkinson? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. Um, getting close. Uh, next item is 0408. That's an action on progress report from the Taft Law School regarding recommendations from uh, its periodic inspection report. Uh, Taft Law School was inspected in 2019 and we required it to provide periodic status reports on its responses to the nine mandatory actions and four suggestions to enhance compliance that we uh, adopted. All but one of the mandatory actions have been addressed um, to staff satisfaction and um, work on the remaining suggestion or rather mandatory action and uh, the suggestions is in progress. Staff recommends that we receive and file the report, uh, require a further report with the 2021 annual report and remind the school uh, that it needs to timely file its future reports. Um, there's a motion on page five of the staff report. Any questions or discussion? Do we have a motion? Chairman, I move. Go ahead. Judge. Judge Herman. I move. But will you read? Oh, you want me to read? Yes, that is. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed, I, I missed that piece. All right, move that the Committee of Bar Examiners uh, and give me just a second. I got to adjust my screen here. Committee of Bar Examiners and
receives and files Taft Law School's progress report is set forth in attachment A, and it's further moved that the law school provide a further progress report documenting compliance or continued to compliance as to each of these recommendations, along with its 2021 annual report. And it's further moved that the law school takes steps to timely file all required compliance documents in the future. At least it's shorter than most jury instructions. <laughs> Is there a second? Is there a second? This is Don, I second. Thank you, Kim. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Dr. Cobb? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Gongora? Mr. Gongora? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Dr. Herman? Yes. Mr. Iseri? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Reyes? Yes. And Dr. Wilkinson? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. Um, so we just did Taft, right? Yeah. I'm yes. losing my place here. OK. Oh, 0409. This is a discussion regarding proposed guidelines for the accredited law school rules. Um, uh, although there's a lot less to digest here than when we considered the new rules themselves last year, we thought we would uh, keep to the same approach where today we're just going to present them to you, um, collect feedback if there is any, and then fine tune as necessary to bring them back for adoption at our October meeting. And Paul, um, as we begin the discussion, uh, would it be all right if we promote Dean Frickberg and Dean Pritikin from sure. CSBAR to participate yeah. in the discussion? Terrific, thank you. Yeah, I was gonna mention them in a minute. Um, oh, thank you. I'm actually mere seconds. Um, so these these come to us from the CS bars. Um, uh, they discuss them and refine them and uh, for the most part uh, wrote them. They, they had their discussions at each of their last uh, several meetings. Um, I wanna thank and introduce again, um, Dean Frickberg and of University of West LA and uh, Martin Pritikin from Concord Law School. Thank them for their work on the proposal and, and allow them to say a few words about the proposal if they would like to. After I also mentioned that of the five proposed guidelines that they drafted, Staff uh, recommends going forward with three of them um, with uh, some uh, revisions, uh, but not two of them. So uh, she's available to explain staff's rationale for that recommendation. Um, uh, again, no action is required today except to give your feedback uh, so that we can bring the final guidelines for adoption in October which will have them in place uh, when the new rules take effect in, on January 1st of next year. And if you need a little time, if uh, you're not ready to share all your, rec your thoughts today, um, I suppose you could transmit them individually to Natalie in the next month or so, uh, making sure you know, to just send it to her and not to a whole bunch of us so as to uh, come into conflict with the open meetings laws. Um, with that, um, let me... Uh, ask uh, Dean Frickberg or Pritikin if uh, either of you wish to make uh, some comments. Thank you, Paul. Um, and thank you all for giving us the opportunity to uh, speak to you. Um, Natalie, that PowerPoint presentation, did you want me to share it or did you want to be in charge of that? How did you want to handle that? Well, you're on mute, I think. Uh, yes, I'll be happy to share it. I'll bring it up now. Okay, great, thank you.
Thank you, Natalie. So we are here to discuss the uh, the guidelines that are proposed for the new accredited law schools that are going into effect. Feel free to chug along, Natalie. I'll uh, I'll keep up with you. Um, myself and Dean Frickberg, uh, I'll take the lead. Dean Frickberg, feel free to jump in at any point uh, if there's anything I miss or get wrong. Um, so we're going to discuss both the CS bars recommendations for the guidelines and the staff edit. Um, now, the purpose of the guidelines is to interpret the rules. And one of the things we were really looking to accomplish with this process is to avoid what had sort of happened under the prior rules and guidelines, which is that you had as many or more separate substantive uh, regulatory requirements in the guidelines than you did in the rules. What we really wanted to have was one authoritative body of rules. Um, and to the extent that we needed guidelines to interpret or provide additional detail or nuance about those rules, they would do so. But we really didn't want to have guidelines that were completely distinct from and, and unconnected to uh, the rules themselves. Um, so the process uh, for the guidelines part of it is uh, the CS Bars Committee, the members reviewed the rules to determine were there any areas where guidelines might be appropriate because perhaps um, there was some ambiguity or some more detailed required. We identified specific discussion topics and we continued the discussion over um, the entire first part of the year over several meetings. Um, ultimately, five guidelines were proposed. Um, a possible future DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion guideline was discussed, but nothing was put forward this time. Um, and then the staff provided um, proposed edits or modifications to the guidelines that CSBARs had proposed, and those two were discussed in a meeting. And I should point out that um, even though it seems like this is a lot of process for just five guidelines, um, actually, uh, it was a lot of work by a lot of people. And the fact that there are only five guidelines proposed by CS bars and three by staff, I think is itself a testament to the success of the prior project in developing the rules. Um, because one of the goals in drafting the rules was that hopefully they wouldn't need a ton of guidelines. And I think the fact that there are only five or three, depending on how you count, um, is a reflection of that. So there are five specific guidelines um, that were proposed, and these are detailed in, um, in uh, attachment 409. Uh, attachment A, which is part of four, uh, the, the main memo, uh, was the CS bars recommendations. Uh, attachment B was the staff edits. Um, we have the materials and, and you know, let us know if you want us to put them on the screen, but I'm happy to also just summarize them. So, Section 4.147C uh, deals with the jointly accredited schools, right? These are schools that because they're accredited by some other regional creditor who presumably is going to be keeping on top of some of the basic, you know, transparency and other issues that the, um, uh, the law school rules also cover, the idea is that they would have um, less uh, onerous reporting obligations in the sense that they wouldn't have the same periodic inspections that, uh, you know, accredited schools that weren't otherwise jointly accredited would undergo. And so 4.147C has a whole list of the provisions uh, of the rules that jointly accredited schools must nevertheless um, comply with. And one of those, C sub I, uh, mentions the annual reports that all accredited schools have to file. So CS bars had proposed that because uh, jointly accredited schools aren't subject to all the same regulations, that there might be a, a different or uh, more truncated report, a separate jointly accredited report that they would have to file and that that would satisfy the requirement of C1 of submitting annual reports. Um, Natalie can correct me, uh, staff's position was that um, the annual report is one of the main vehicles by which jointly accredited schools would be communicating with state bar on a regular basis and providing them information. And so, you know, to the extent that the whatever template is developed, you know, may say, you know, X is not applicable to jointly accredited schools, that may happen. But to just, as a guideline say, there will be a separate thing. They don't have to file an annual report. That wasn't something that they felt was necessary or appropriate. Is that fair, Natalie? 
Sure, yes. And so because this is new, uh, working with that new report, understanding and making sure we get the correct information to the committee, and also understanding that there may be other stakeholder reports. For example, the disclosure that schools file each year that's required under statute, uh, Business and Professions Code 6061. So I think that uh, we are aligned in terms of the goal and then um, the way to effectuate that goal um, will be determined as these rules implement. But I think that we're on the same page, yes. And from my perspective, I'm not, um, I'm not yet willing to assume that um, other accreditors such as WASC are going to look at all the things that we still need to look at as regulators. Um, we've, um, for jointly accredited schools, we've waived the periodic inspection requirement, but, but we still need to have a window into what the school is doing um, in order to make sure that we are exercising our function. Makes sense. Um, I'm, I'm happy if there are questions about particular ones, but I'm also happy to, you know, plow forward. And of course, people can feel free to jump uh, back to questions about ones that were covered previously. So the second one has to do with 4.160A1. And as a reminder, 4.160 itself is really the single rule uh, that has many, many subparts that really incorporates most, if not all, of the substantive regulations that were previously contained in the old guidelines. Um, so 4.160A1 uh, addresses the requirement that a law school have at least its primary administrative office in all campuses within California. So one of the things that was raised was that if you have, uh, for example, an online institution like my own, um, there might be, uh, you know, documents that are stored outside of California. I mean, that can happen for a non-online law school too. Plenty of you know, entities have documents stored by Amazon Web Services and you know, who knows what state or what country or you know, planet they have their servers on. Um, and in terms of services, right, Concord is part of Purdue University Global, which is an online university. The university is based in, Indi in Indiana, even though we're based in California. So we may have some shared services like registrar's office or financial aid office that are in other states. And so there was a proposal um, for a guideline that essentially said that um, as long as we do maintain our administrative office in all law school campuses in California, we don't violate the rule if we host or store electronic records um, outside of California or if we offer some student services the offices of personnel outside of California. Um, the staff edit, Natalie, do you want me to summarize or do you want to take the lead on this? I'm happy to handle it either way. Uh, sure, just uh, basically ag agreeing with that. And it ended up being to particularly prescient to consider this um, as the schools operated through COVID, understanding that personnel and uh, facilities could be anywhere, but uh, wanting to make clear that there needed to be a location in California where students could go in person to access the staff or to access records uh, when they've got questions or need support. So really just agreeing, but um, underlining that concept and need for a location in California. I just, right. I had a question. Uh, this seems like a no brainer, uh, but um, historically have there been uh, schools primarily located out of California? Well, uh, there are two law school deans that are located outside of California. Uh, one school is um, an accredited distance school using the distance only modality. Um, another one is an unaccredited correspondence school. Uh, we have had, particularly during the pandemic, some staff uh, be outside of California and certainly um, storage be outside of California as well. Um, North Central University has an administrative storage facility in Arizona, uh, though its location is in Southern California. Uh, North Central is the school that recently acquired a JFK. Okay. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so moving on to uh, the third one, so 4.160A6B reflects the requirement uh, that when a law school refers in public communications to being accredited or provisionally accredited, as the case may be, um, they need to clearly indicate 
that um, such accreditation is by the Committee of Bar Examiners of State Bar of California, and um, that is the basis for their um, ability to qualify to take the California Bar Examiner Practice Law in California. Now, as you can see from what I just said, that can be a bit of a mouthful. And the concern was is that given that so much communication uh, goes on online these days, that if a law school is communicating via Twitter or you know, another social media platform, we're literally, uh, you know, or maybe it's a Facebook ad or something where there's an image and you have room for you know, 80 characters or something, there literally wouldn't be room to state all that on the uh, document itself. You, you literally would be precluding um, them from using those forms of communication. And so the proposed guideline was that when a law school is communicating via means where it's not practicable to um, include the whole disclosure, that a law school could satisfy this requirement um, by having a, a prominent hyperlink um, that leads to a web page or other document that does contain the full disclosure language. Um, and the staff edit, I, I think, captures the same idea in frankly more succinct and, and probably clearer language. Uh, but that was the intent of that, that third one. Natalie, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that. Um, basically agree, uh, just making clear that it's important for public protection purposes to be sure that that hyperlink is uh, clear, easy to find uh, in a typeface that's similar size and uh, prominent location so that that information is conveyed to the public. Thank you. Uh, the fourth one, 4.160B11. Um, so that rule requires that schools uh, maintain accurate and complete records. And specifically the rule says that they um, need to maintain sufficient records to demonstrate compliance from its last two periodic inspections. That's the relevant portion. And so the potential concern that was raised there is, you know, given the rules provide that law schools are to undergo uh, periodic inspections every five years or as much as every seven years in the discretion of the state bar. Um, if you need to maintain records uh, going back to inspection periods, that means you're maintaining every type of record that might be relevant to an inspection for a period of up to 14 years. And there was a, a view amongst some of the committee members that that was probably um, unnecessarily onerous uh, given that, um, at least based on the experience of some of the deans undergoing inspections recently, there were many categories of documents where the inspection team really was only interested in looking back at the most recent several years. Um, and so perhaps that would be sufficient. Um, I believe the staff edit, which would propose to eliminate that, um, was based on uh, the idea that uh, it's, it's, I guess, too early or it's too hard to sort of predict up front what type of records you would or wouldn't want particular law schools to maintain. And especially given that more and more records maintained electronically these days, the burden of maintaining um, records for potentially 10 to 14 years wouldn't be as significant as it would be if, you know, previously had to, you know, stuff things in file cabinets and that sort of thing. Um, so the recommendation was to eliminate that guideline. And again, Natalie, I don't know if you have anything to add. Sure, I think that that's part of it, um, the ease of maintaining the records electronically. Uh, there also were two other pieces. Um, this guideline suggested only instances of non-compliance, but you saw today as an example in the inspection report, the committee also makes other um, administrative recommendations that are important, but don't rise to the level of filing a notice of non-compliance. And so you need a way to track those. And then finally, um, in this past year in particular, on several occasions uh, for a few schools, a trend was noticed over a period of three inspections in which schools were responsive to recommendations, but weren't able to maintain that responsiveness. And it reappeared again at the next inspection. And so um, we've learned that it is important to look over that three inspection trend period. And that's something that we'll be doing for you more so uh, going forward. And so uh, that's why we needed that full uh, panoply of information. Thank you, Natalie. Um, and then the final one, 4.160D5, regarding the minimum contents of an academic program plan. So 4.160D 
lays out um, what are the required elements of a um, program of legal education for an accredited law school. And the fifth one of those is that a law school must adopt and maintain a written plan for its academic program. Um, the rule itself doesn't specify what should be in that academic um, plan. And so the proposed guideline would uh, be advisory and then in that it says the topics to be covered in the plan should include, but need not be limited to the following. And then it lists six main categories like program description, current curriculum, post current changes and, and so forth. Um, and so the idea is to give some structure and consistency to what the plans the different schools will be filing, not to try and limit them if they think other topics are important to share, um, but to at least try and set a baseline about what you can expect from all law schools. And I believe the only staff edit to this one was uh, the deletion of a comma, which grammarians can debate whether it should be there or not, but um, I think they pretty much agree with the substance. Agree. And that's pretty much it for the, the, what the five guidelines are. Again, happy to take any questions or you know, any discussion about any of these. Any questions, anyone? I think that Dean Frickberg has a comment. Go ahead, uh, Dean Frickberg. Thank you. Uh, I'll definitely keep it short. Uh, just wanted to, in addition to what Dean Pritikin said, I think he covered everything from the presentation extremely well. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure that the, the committee also heard that the, the relationship that the CS bars has now with Natalie Leonard and with staff and with you, Paul Kramer, that we've created, a, I think, a, a very healthy relationship of partnership. And I think you can see that in this product as we're looking at it. And also there's a very organic atmosphere now where the CS bars for this past year drafted six proposed guidelines, presented five, now staff has given three, but you'll see that all the guidelines that the CS bars were concerned with are included within the staff edits as well. So it's just a minor difference of opinion, but all the same topics have been covered. So I think it's, it's a very healthy partnership and a very organic evolutionary process. And I just wanted to point that out. So you're, you're saying we brought forward all the materials and uh, tried to convey areas where we agree and uh, as well as those where we disagree. But we didn't just chop them off and um, lead you to have to present them on your own again. And I think that's the way we should do business. Frankly, I'm glad that you appreciate that. Oh, yeah, and I echo that. So thank you all. Okay, um, I've forgotten how long the motion is here. Um, does anybody have any other questions or comments before we consider a motion? Actually, there was no motion. Yeah, That's this why, is a discussion. Really I short. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, any okay. feedback? Anything um, any of the members of the committee want want us to uh, put in our pipe and process? Um, uh, I'm in fire territory, so I'm not going to smoke anything right now. Um, and Paul, uh, I'll just raise uh, whether you want to consider having a team of one or two available between now and October to receive any public comment that might come in as you did for the rules. Um, that's a possible option. Yeah, um, uh, we can have a, a unofficial subcommittee of less than a, a quorum. Uh, as we did the last time, Dr. Cow and I worked with Natalie um, to um, process um, all the information that came in. I'm not expecting a lot here, but um, Dr. Cow, are you interested in um, getting together if we need to? Absolutely. Love to have the band back together. Okay. I don't think we need a motion for that. Do we? Defer to Caroline as to that. Um, we can just do it um, because we No, are... we don't need it. I don't think we need a motion. Okay. And it's not creating a, um, you're not creating, it's, it's not an official creation of a, a subcommittee. Okay, no, and the just... good news is that there's been an open eight month period for public comment. So there's a good chance that most of it has been received, but there is still a further opportunity to receive more. Yeah, I mean, I, I as a procrastinator, I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> by somebody else getting their comments in at the last minute. Um, so I guess that concludes that item. If we, uh, one more last chance for anyone to, to comment. Okay, um, the next one, let me get back to my outline is 
Oh, thank you, deans, uh, for your participation um, and all the work you put into this. Thank you. Um, o. 410, which is a report on administrative updates at our accredited and our registered unaccredited law schools. This is just an informational item. No action is required. Um, I'll ask if anyone has any questions or comments about the, the information that was in the, the one page report. I just have one update. Uh, People's College of Law this week named Juan Manuel Serignana as uh, the dean of that law school. Do you know and when he's going to take office? I, I believe that he is in the process of assuming that office now, and uh, it'll be placed on the next committee step, um, administrative update. Okay. Yeah, this is a, for those who are new to us, this is something we have on just about every agenda because um, there's always a little bit of something to report. So then the final item is 0411, and that's our 2020 to 2021 educational standards, goals, and accomplishments. Um, we've certainly had a busy year. Um, and if the resources are available next year, I'd like to keep us busy with one project, which is to review and probably revise the registr registered schools, the unaccredited schools rules and their guidelines. Um, in the recent past, Natalie and I have noticed a few places where modernization and process streamlining is certainly in order. And uh, as we continue to, to work together, we'll probably notice some more. You may have some of your own. Um, uh, so feel free to pass those on to Natalie or I. Um, uh, but that's one thing I just hope that we have time to consider uh, in the next year, now that we've um, fully overhauled the accredited school rules. Um, Otherwise, I don't really have anything to highlight in the agenda. Um, I do want to thank Dolores for her service as vice chair this year uh, of the subcommittee uh, and all the other subcommittee members for your, your work in uh, reviewing the various items that have come before us. And especially want to thank Natalie for all her work. I found it a pleasure to work with her. Um, you can talk things out with her. Um, uh, she's not defensive. Uh, and she's very forthright. And uh, whether or not I am still in this position next year, I, I do wish her upon the next chair because I think that will be a good thing for him or her. Um, so the appropriate motion is to approve the report. Um, I think it's longer than that, but uh, let's see. Does anyone want to make a motion or does anyone have any questions or comments before we consider a motion? I will move that the report on the 2020-2021 educational standards, goals, and accomplishments be approved. Thank you. So is there a second? I'd like to second that. This is Michael. Kim? Dr. Bolton? Yes. Dr. Kyle? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Gongora? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Judge Herman? Yes. Mr. Isari? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. And Dr. Wilkinson? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. Um, and with that, I. Uh, I think we got it done in less than an hour and 15. Um, Thank you. So Esther, all yours. Thank you. So the only matter we have left in our open session is the two o'clock presentation on implicit bias. I think now would be a good time to take a lunch break. Um, when we do reconvene, we'll be reconvening in closed session and we will come back to open session at 2 p.m. for the presentation. It's 12.15 right now. Why don't we reconvene at 12.40 uh, in closed session? And we'll see you all back here in open at 2 p.m. Thank you. Thank you.
a woman. Sounds uh, shot, like a good read. Shot shot a woman and was sentenced to life without possibility of parole. Not a, not a, not a homicide. Very wow. interesting. But same subject. And our California Supreme Court just upheld eight, uh, uh, 2018 legislation that says that in California, uh, uh, juveniles cannot be tried as adults no matter what the charge if they're under 16. Very interesting. Okay, so we're back in open session and thank you Judge Bennett for joining us. Before we begin the presentation, Kim, can you please take roll? Yes. James Fulton. Robert Brody. Present. Michael Cow. Present. Alex Chen. James Efting, Kareem Gongara, Dolores Heisinger, here. Judge Herman, here. Michael Isari, here. Larry Kaplan, Paul Kramer, present. Alex Lawrence, here. Vince Reyes. Here. Don Wilkinson. Here. James Bolton. Alex Chan. James Efting. Kareem Gongara. Okay, Ms. Chair is here. Give me a second. We have a quorum, Ms. Chair. Thank you very much, Kim. And with that, um, I'm going to turn this over to Judge Bennett. I'm just going to jump in and give a quick introduction of Judge Bennett. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm David Lane. I am the attorney for moral character determinations. Uh, at the State Bar of California. And I'm excited uh, to introduce Judge Mark W. Bennett, who was a US District Court judge in the Northern District of Iowa for 24 years. And as part of the ongoing series of trainings for the committee and at the request of the committee to fulfill its role in conducting administrative reviews of staff moral character determinations, uh, Judge Bennett will be talking to us today about implicit bias. Um, this is a topic that has been uh, trending, as they say lately, uh, the topic of much discussion. Um, and it's one that Judge Bennett has experience in, has been teaching about and doing research uh, in the area of uh, for decades. Um, before he was a judge for 24 years, um, a district court judge. Uh, judge Bennett was in private practice for about 16 and a half years. Um, and then when he retired in March of 2019, he became the first director of the Drake University Law School's Institute for Justice Reform and Innovation. Uh, over the past about decade, Judge Bennett has written 28 law review articles, including five that have to do with implicit bias. In 2017, he helped found the National Implicit Bias Network, uh, and he has been involved in educating thousands of state and federal judges, appellate judges, lawyers, court staff across the country on this topic. Uh, finally, uh, Judge Bennett was the first judge in the nation um, to both discuss implicit bias with potential jurors uh, when he was on the bench and to give uh, a written instruction on implicit bias. Uh, with that, um, please join me in welcoming Judge Mark Bennett. Thank you so much, David. And it's a real uh, honor and pleasure to uh, share some of my expertise with you uh, this afternoon. I was telling uh, David that the irony is that uh, five out of the last six weeks, I've commuted to California on a project I'm working on out there. But uh, this week, I've 
I'm back in, in Iowa. And I want to tell you a really funny story. I just actually thought of it while you were introducing me, David. I was the first federal, I was the first judge in the country to develop an implicit bias jury instruction. And I did that with the help of some world-class experts. But a couple of years after I started using it, there was a lot written about the fact that I was the first judge to use it. Uh, California uh, asked if they could uh, have a copy of mine. So I sent it to them. And about a year later, I get a letter from the uh, uh, folks who do the uh, stock jury instructions for California saying that they had uh, trademark or uh, I'm sorry, a copyrighted the uh, jury instruction. And that if I wanted to use it, I had to pay them a fee. And uh, I wrote them back a very short but polite letter saying, I don't think so. And uh, I continued to use it for uh, more than a decade after that. But can you all see my slides? Because I can't see them, but that's fine. Okay, great. As long as you can see them, that's what counts. So uh, just start off with a short uh, definition. Oh, and by the way, I'd love to take questions. So maybe there are some skeptics out there or true believers about implicit bias. Whatever you think, if you have a question, you ask me. I really do enjoy taking questions. Uh, questions on the fly. <clears throat> so this is kind of the most well-recognized uh, definition of implicit bias. Uh, I actually like the term unconscious bias because it's a little bit more uh, uh, self-explanatory, but uh, social scientists still use the word implicit a lot. So the main characteristic is that it's an instant and automatic association of stereotypes or attitudes towards particular groups without our conscious awareness. And so uh, my, there's another definition that I really like. And Dr. Mirzin Banaji is at uh, Harvard. Uh, she was chair of the psychology department for quite a while. And she's one of the three uh, people who invented the implicit association test, which I'm going to talk about, urge you to take it, find out if any of you have taken it. And uh, she is one of the people uh, that I consulted when I started reading about implicit bias, recognizing my own implicit biases and felt I had to do something. And I came up with this idea that I should craft an implicit bias jury instruction and Dr. Banaji was very helpful. But she talks about, it's a very simple definition. Implicit bias is the thumbprint of the culture of the brain. And I think that is really true. So this is somebody nobody of you would know. I met her when I was about seven years old. Uh, she's a very light-skinned African-American. She's now deceased. And I want to tell you a little bit about her and then tie her into implicit bias. Her name was Lena Alice Smith. Um, my mother died when I was young, and I was raised by an African-American woman who uh, kind of raised me and my two uh, brothers had no uh, romantic relationship with my father, but she would stay with us a lot overnight and then go uh, help raise her own family. But Lena Alva Smith was a very good friend of hers, one of her best friends, and I had a chance to meet her. And she's the person that inspired me to go to law school and become a civil rights lawyer. But I'll just tell you a little bit about her. She was born in the 1880s in Kansas. She moved to Buxton, Iowa, which is a town that no longer exists, but is very important because it was the only city in Iowa ever to be racially integrated 50-50, very unusual for Iowa. We have a pretty small percentage of African-Americans. Uh, she started off with a hair salon and then a real estate agency. She moved to Minnesota uh, and started the real estate agency and the hair salon. She was on the sixth floor of the Plymouth building, which is still right smack in downtown Minnesota. And then on the seventh floor was the old Northwestern College of Law, which was a night law school. And she enrolled in law school and became the, uh, uh, at age 35, the first African-American female lawyer admitted to the bar in Minnesota. She was a wonderful civil rights lawyer and uh, in uh, the 20s and 30s and 40s was involved in all kinds of significant civil rights uh, cases in the state of Minnesota, also worked on the Scottsboro boy cases. Uh, but I, I, and I was uh, 
working on a uh, book about the first uh, minority lawyers in each of the 50 states. And I started with Lena Alice Smith. And I was in the a library in the Minneapolis Hennepin County Library. And I came across some old microfish. And I found this case, which is really incredible. And uh, the case is uh, State versus Haywood. It was a typical rape case in the sense that the victim was white. Everybody in the courtroom was white, except Mr. Haywood and Lena Alice Smith. They were the only two African Americans in the, in the uh, uh, courtroom. And of course, all the jurors were not only white, but they were male because uh, Minnesota did not allow females to serve on juries. And this is what she wrote in a uh, motion for new trial back in uh, 1928. The court fully realizes, I'm sure, that the very fact that the defendant was a colored boy and the prosecutrix a white woman and the entire panel composed of white men, it was a delicate situation to begin with. And counsel for the state took advantage of this delicate situation. Perhaps the jurors were, with few exceptions, conscientious in their expressions of no race prejudice. And then here's the amazing part. Yet it is common knowledge, yet it is common knowledge, she wrote, a feeling can be so dormant and subjected to one's subconsciousness that one is wholly ignorant of its existence. But if the proper stimulus is applied, it comes to the front. And more often than not, one is deceived into believing that it is justice speaking to him when in fact it is prejudice blinding him to all justice. That is as good of a definition of implicit bias as there is. And uh, she, it's almost like she was a PhD in psychology uh, as well as a civil rights lawyer because it's just amazing that she understood exactly how implicit bias works uh, in our brain. So we think of it as being something within the last 20 years, uh, which there's been a tremendous explosion of research and articles about it, but some folks understood it uh, nearly a century ago. So uh, the last civil case that I tried, I was helping out uh, the federal court in North Dakota. And I was up in uh, Fargo uh, trying a case and I checked into the hotel on a Sunday night and I got up early Monday morning and I was, this was a brand new hotel. And this was just three years ago. And so I was uh, on a, a treadmill working out and I looked up and I saw this sign and it made me laugh, but it also was kind of sad. And here's, if you haven't figured it out yet, here's what caught my attention. Consult your physician before exercising and following his advice. That struck me as odd because my personal physician uh, in two different cities, uh, two different doctors for the last 30 years has been a female doctor. And you would think in, uh, you know, uh, 2019s that you wouldn't see a sign about doctors and his, but you know what? Um, it's hard to get away from these stereotypes. And I'm going to plead guilty this afternoon, right before I, well, right as I signed on, to engaging in a stereotype, a gender stereotype. I was told that uh, Devin uh, McFarland, I believe, would be assisting, and I had communicated with Devin. She had sent me the link. Well, uh, you know, I don't know a lot of Devons, but the ones I know are all male. And I just assumed she was a male. And when she came up on Zoom, I thought, boy, there you go again, gender stereotyping. I had no basis to assume that she was a male, but I did. And so we all stereotype. The trick is to not let our stereotypes affect our judgments or lead to uh, biases. So if I could only show you one image about implicit bias, it would be one that my 30-year-old, 31-year-old daughter who's an archivist at a public library sent to me several years ago. She had zero interest in the law, uh, but she has great interest in implicit bias. And she sent me this and she said, Daddy, I think you could use it in your talks. And she was absolutely right. So here's the image. Now the question is, which one is a federal convicted felon 
and which one served time in a federal prison. And it's not Martha Stewart. Uh, and I'm sorry, it is Martha Stewart. It's not Snoop Dogg. But most people would stereotype about that. So I want to tell you a little bit about my experience with the IAT. So the IAT is the implicit association test. And about 15 years ago, I had for over a decade taught an advanced employment discrimination class at Drake Law School with a co-professor who was associate dean. And I went down one day for our first class and I was there early. And he said, Mark, uh, have you ever taken an IAT? And I said, Russ, I don't know what you're talking about. What is an IAT? And he said, oh, it's the implicit association test. I said, what's that? And he said, well, it's a test that's been out for a number of years now, and it can determine what your unconscious implicit biases are. And he looked at me and he said, you need to take it as soon as you can, particularly take the white black one because you're gonna do great on it because I was a civil rights lawyer. I represented more, mostly black clients. I was raised by an African-American woman. And more importantly, we were just a second law firm in Iowa racially integrated at the partner level when I hired an assistant US attorney out of the US attorney's office to join our law firm. And one of the highlights of my professional life was swearing him in as a state court judge uh, several years after he had become the U.S. attorney in uh, Iowa, first African-American U.S. attorney. So I went home and I took the test and I couldn't figure it out. I had a strong anti-Black implicit bias and it made no sense to me. So I took it the next day, had a strong anti-Black implicit bias. Couldn't believe it. I waited about a week and I took it a third time and I had a strong anti-Black implicit bias. So I assumed what I think any trained lawyer or judge would, that the implicit association test was invalid. And I proceeded to read everything I could about it. Again, this is 15 years ago. You could literally, you know, there were maybe 60 articles. And I quickly became convinced that the problem wasn't with the test, but that the problem was with me. And it was very hard for me to accept because I had always considered myself so egalitarian and colorblind that I realized that I wasn't. So I stewed about that for a while and then I just reached out to two of the three people who invented the implicit association test. And that's how I got on my journey about learning about implicit bias and developing the jury instruction with their help. So um, I wanna to talk to you a little bit. Well, let's, let's see. Uh, I don't know if you have the raise your hand button, uh, but anybody want to jump in and just say, uh, or if you can raise your hand, um, how many of you have taken the implicit association test? There are about a hundred different tests you could take. Okay, David has. See a few more raising their hand. Uh, great. Well, that's wonderful. Uh, if you haven't taken an implicit association test, I really encourage you to, to take several of them. Uh, I would start with black, white, then maybe skin tone, and then uh, Asian, uh, do some of the religious ones with Muslim. Uh, there's all kinds of ones that you can take. And, it'll, uh, and you don't have to share that information with anybody else, but I think you'll learn. And one of the interesting things that I'm gonna talk about it is, uh, almost everybody in the room, I'm sure, even the non-lawyers who are serving on the state bar committee uh, have strong egalitarian views. But there's no relationship between your strong egalitarian views and your unconscious bias. Matter of fact, sometimes there's an inverse relationship. The stronger your egalitarian views or explicit biases, the greater your implicit biases. So I really encourage you to go to Project Implicit, uh, it was started at Yale in 1998. It's now housed at Harvard, Washington, and Virginia. Took off with the big National uh, Institute of Mental Health Grant in 2003. Over 25 million tests have been taken online since 1998. Now averages over 25,000 per week. Uh, it's a virtual laboratory where you can test for anything uh, uh, on our uh, National Implicit Bias Network, 
somebody was talking about how somebody recently developed an unconscious bias uh, test, an IAT test about people who have pets. Why anybody would want to know that is beyond me, but it's uh, having created some IATs uh, myself, uh, uh, it's not that hard to do and it's kind of interesting. So these are just some of the examples of what you can test for. This is what Project Implicit uh, looks like. When you take a test, it takes about 12 and a half minutes to take the test and you get your uh, score. There's no such thing as a good or bad score, but it's just generally no bias, moderate or strong bias. And so um, they've taken this off the website, but for the first, uh, up until a few years ago, they had these IAT findings. Implicit biases are pervasive. I agree with that completely. They're incredibly pervasive. People are seldom aware of their implicit biases. I kind of disagree with this one because unless you've taken an IAT, you would have no way of knowing whether you have an implicit bias or not. So I would say people who have not taken the IAT are always unaware of their implicit biases. Implicit biases predict behavior. I don't think that's true. I think implicit biases sometimes predict behavior. And there's all kinds of studies to show sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. And the magic bullet, if there ever is one with regard to implicit bias, will take place when we can predict behavior and when we can't, when I, implicit biases can predict behavior. If it didn't predict behavior, you all be here this afternoon, but I wouldn't be here because I'd have no interest in it. The only reason why I'm interested in it is it does predict behavior sometimes, and that behavior can lead to grossly, uh, gross injustices in both our civil and criminal justice system. People differ in their levels of implicit bias, absolutely true. There are 52 of us on this Zoom call. If all 52 were to take uh, 10 of the same implicit association tests, virtually no one would have the same uh, scores. And it's almost like a snowflake. Virtually everybody's, we're all gonna have implicit biases, but they're going to vary with regard to different uh, subject matters and different strengths of bias. So I strongly encourage those who haven't taken the IAT, you'll learn a lot about yourself. Uh, and I think it's important to take the test. Now, I will add that there is a small cadre of uh, law professors and, uh, and uh, cognitive psychologists who are doubting Thomas's about the implicit association test. And they question both its validity and reliability. And there is some merit to their complaints, but save one or two who are truly outrageous outliers, people who are critical of the ability of the IAT to actually measure implicit biases uh, don't suggest that there aren't such a thing as implicit biases. So uh, uh, doing IAT work is interesting. I've certainly done it myself. I've got uh, several current studies underway, but I wouldn't get too hung up on the validity or reliability of the IAT. So in order to understand how implicit biases work, we need to take this afternoon uh, kind of a deep dive into some psychology principles that are absolutely generally recognized in the fields of cognitive psychology. So I'm going to talk about uh, five of them. And we'll just take them in order. So thinking fast and slow, actually Daniel Kahneman is a uh, psychologist, but he won the Nobel Prize in economics because they don't give it in psychology. And he wrote this best-selling book, Thinking Fast and Slow, a number of years ago. And he uh, developed, he wasn't the first one, but he made really kind of popular this notion about system one and system two. And we all have, our brains all work in system one and system two. So for uh, uh, lawyers, let's say, or judges, uh, system one is something that happens fast. Uh, you're making an objection, violates the confrontation clause. You don't really know if it violates the confrontation clause or not. The judges don't really know for sure. It's a complicated area. 
but you have to rule quickly, that's a system one. It's also unconscious, automatic, everyday decision. System two is slower. So for example, if a lawyer is writing a brief uh, or uh, somebody at the state, the state bar committee is putting together a, uh, a pamphlet or uh, information uh, that's more slow and deliberate and effortful and conscious, that's system two. Uh, judges like writing an opinion, system two, et cetera. It is true that implicit bias has a more rich environment to affect our decisions in system one, but it also permeates a system two. Uh, I think in terms of picture, so I really like this picture about system one being out front and system two being uh, slower. And part of trying to de-bias is to try and take some things that we do in system one and kind of have them morph into system two. And I'm gonna talk about that at the very end. So what's the relationship between explicit and implicit biases? I, that's really a fascinating question. And so many lawyers and judges that I've talked to assume because they have no explicit, for example, race biases, that that means it would be virtually impossible or totally unlikely that they would have unconscious or implicit biases. It would be nice to believe that if it were true, but it's not. So I'm sure everybody on this Zoom call today considers yourself to have strong egalitarian beliefs. And that's good. We want people to have strong egalitarian beliefs. But that is not a magic bullet when it comes to unconscious bias. So um, there's actually, I don't want to get too far into statistics, but there's something called Pearson's coalition, uh, correlation coefficient. Uh, and it, member, uh, it uh, measures the correlation between any two uh, variables. And for a uh, uh, you want an R value close to one for it to have any meaning, you know, certainly 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 and above establish a, a correlation. Well, there's no correlation between explicit measures of bias, for example, the modern racism scale is the most common test used to determine whether anybody has explicit racial biases. I've taken the modern racism scale test multiple times, never show any explicit biases, but yet uh, if I were to take the uh, uh, black-white implicit association test after this talk, I'm pretty confident I would have the same score that I've had dozens and dozens of times, and that would be a strong anti-black implicit bias. So you don't get off the hook just because you have egalitarian views. So now I want to talk about in-group favoritism. In-group favoritism, it's sometimes called the affinity bias. That's more the cognitive uh, psychology term for it. We all engage in uh, in-group favoritism. I'll give you a classic example because it involves doing a presentation about implicit bias. So probably six or seven years ago, I was heading up to St. Paul, Minnesota to do a couple hour training session for uh, lawyers from all over the country that worked for uh, a national banking system. I was actually the home loan bank. And uh, uh, I knew I was gonna be a little bit late. They knew I was gonna be a little bit late because I was rushing up from court. And when I got there, I had to rush into the room. And as I was setting up my laptop to do the presentation, I looked around and I was very surprised by two things. Tremendous diversity in the room, lots of, uh, female lawyers, which was great. Uh, significant number of lawyers of color was great. But then I observed one thing, and it ties into the affinity bias. There were never a group of female lawyers with a male lawyer sitting in between them. And there was never a group of lawyers of color with a Caucasian lawyer sitting between them. And so I looked at the group and I was starting my presentation. I said, 
I'm just curious, were the seats assigned or were they randomly assigned and you could sit wherever you want? And they said, no, we could sit wherever you want. And I said, well, look around the room. Do you see anything unusual? Nobody saw anything unusual, but I did. It was a classic example of affinity bias. People were sitting with people who were most like them, according to their own stereotypes. And that happens all the time, happens all the time. Uh, I didn't recognize it in my own judging uh, until I got involved in researching uh, about inclusive bias. And I, I, I noticed I had a wonderful judicial assistant, fancy federal term for a secretary, and she had a law degree. And I would get about 400 applicants a year for uh, clerkships. And uh, she would always screen them and give me the top 10 or so. And once I got involved in implicit bias, it dawned on me that she would give me law clerk applicants who kind of looked like me when I was their age. Uh, did they go to a private college in Minnesota? If they played high school tennis? All of these things that mirrored my background had absolutely nothing to do with their qualifications to be my law clerk but it was just her natural projecting my affinity bias onto her in the selection. And we changed that uh, completely um, and went to a much more objective factor. But the bottom line is almost all of us engage in affinity bias every single day. And that in-group favoritism um, can lead to bias and discrimination and it can. And so, 20 years ago, if you ask cognitive psychologists, did bias and discrimination come from in-group favoritism or out-group hostility? That would be hostility towards people who aren't like us. The overwhelming majority would say out-group hostility. That has flipped in the last 20 years. Now, over 95% of cognitive psychologists would say that discrimination is a result of in-group favoritism. It's not that we have any hostility towards a uh, uh, student who didn't play any high school or college sports, that went to a state university, that didn't grow up in Minnesota. We don't have any hostility towards that person, but we engage in in-group favoritism because they're not as much like us as somebody else. And so you have to really watch how your in-group favoritism affects decisions that you make really on a daily basis. And so uh, in-group favoritism leads to positive emotions like admiration, sympathy, and trust, positive actions like hiring, promotion, or positive references, and they're reserved for in-groups, but they're withheld from out-groups. And that can lead to bias and discrimination in all kinds of ways. So I want you to reflect as you leave this 